Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the April the 4th uh, meeting of the Waterbury Selectors. <coughs> I wish to welcome all of you. Uh, again, try to keep uh, all discussions on point and uh, limit your discussions. If there's any questions, we'd be more than glad to enter those, those questions. First, we go. Uh, we could have a motion to approve the agenda. Can I ask to add liquor licenses for Hen of the Wood and Ty? Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the minutes? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Uh, motion passes. We now go to the section uh, on public. Public is the portion of our select no, board. Oh, good, sorry. In second. If I could have a motion to approve the select board, uh, the incenta agenda items for the uh, liquor license for Maxi's. Zen Barn, Old Stage Coach Inn, Pro Pig Brewery, Freak Folk Brewery, Jim's Pizza, and Stowe Street Cafe. And Hand of the Wood. And Hand of the Wood, right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. <clears throat> now we'll go to the section of the meeting where it's for the public. This is for uh, any items that are not covered under a warned agenda item. If you have a, a, a short thing that you want to bring to the board's attention, uh, we would love to hear from you. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? There being none, we'll move on to select board items. Uh, we have a presentation by the Center of Vermont Prevention Coalition. And we were just joined by Olivia LeClaire. Okay, she's on. Uh, this is on. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'll have you introduce yourself and tell a little bit about the uh, coalition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Olivia LeClaire, and I'm an AmeriCorps VISTA, and I'm serving as a rural community organizer for the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition. And so our coalition is made up of many nonprofits in the substance use realm. Um, we are an interdisciplinary um, collaboration of professional organizations and agencies working in prevention, harm reduction, disease prevention, treatment, recovery, and restorative justice. And the Central Vermont Prevention um, coalition is working with the Central Vermont Medical Center, which is actually the backbone of our coalition and a strong member of our coalition. Um, so in 2019, we received a three-year grant from the federal government to address the opioid crisis here in Central Vermont. And one initiative that has come out of um, our coalition is the organization of these drug and alcohol community forums that we have put on throughout Washington County. Um, so far, we have organized two, and we have two upcoming this month. Um, and these forums really come at a critical time um, as drug and alcohol use and overdose rate, rates has have increased dramatically during the pandemic um, in every part of Vermont. So specifically, alarmingly, the youth substance rates have also increased in the past few years, and this is something that we um, address in our forums. So I'm here tonight to invite you all to the community forum for the Harwood Unified School District, which includes Waterbury. And this is on Wednesday, April 27th from 6 to 7.30 um, via Zoom. And then we also have an in-person option, um, which will be at the Waterbury Municipal Office. Um, and basically, I just wanted to come here tonight to let you all know about this important event as influential people in your communities, your attendance would be really greatly appreciated and you all also know best how to promote in your town so any insight on how to better promote this event or any questions that you think should be addressed in the yeah. forum or here tonight um, would be great thank you 
Thanks, Olivia. Are there any questions by the board? Yeah, uh, what time is it going to be on Wednesday, the 27th? Yep, 6 to 7.30 p.m. What's the format um, for the form? Is there is a panel or how does that work? Yeah, so we have a group of panelists that are all um, members of our coalition and we have um, people with lived experience. We have um, primary prevention, recovery, um, and a doctor actually from UVM. And basically they speak about resources um, available here in central Vermont. And then we also have time for, which is an open forum for people to ask questions and work together to brainstorm on how we can make the, um, your community a healthier place. And that's pretty much like the format of the night. Have you posted the meeting on Front Porch Forum? Yeah, so we plan to do so um, when, the, um, when the forum gets a little bit closer in the month, um, but that's a great idea and definitely something that we'll do for sure. Right, I'm sure the Waterbury Roundabout slash reader will probably post that in the calendar of events. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Any other questions? Any questions from the audience? Any questions from Zoom land? If not, thank you, Olivia, for uh, telling us about this most worthwhile project. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is Be the Change Request for Pollinator Garden. I don't see anybody here on online from no, the data change. So I'll uh, I'll pitch it for them. Mm -hmm. um, so back in January, a gentleman by the name of Patrick Kitchen uh, sent me an email and uh, he works with an organization called Be the Change, B-E-E, -E, like honeybees or po other pollinators. And he said that um, this organization is working throughout the state uh, to uh, encourage the enhancement and saving of pollinators. Um, they've sent out a, an email to most towns in the state. They're trying to get uh, 251 acres, if you will, uh, of pollinator gardens planted. That would be one in every town if they were completely successful. Um, so they're asking the town to each donate some land, and I have clarified they're not asking us to donate in fee simple the property, they're just asking us to donate a parcel where a pollinator garden could be planted, and they suggest this could be a space from a school and a park, under utility poles, any unused space, uh, be the change, will uh, till the area and then provide uh, seeds. So I passed it off to Bill Woodruff and said, you know, if we were going to do this, is there an opportunity to be involved in this? Uh, Kitchen did indicate in January that they had 25 towns already uh, served up. So I'll pass this map around, which is a map of out here. And the blue area that is shown there is where Bill Woodruff is proposing that it uh, this pollinator garden could be planned in. And it includes the banking between the parking lot and, uh, and the playing fields, and then some of the areas on the side of the parking lot and out near the uh, ward garden and the other garden that we already keep out there. So, um, you know, Bill emailed it back and said, here's a map of some possible lands that could be utilized, the soils are good sits next to community garden space and recreation fields. It's in an area where there are many other trees and plantings that could benefit from attracting some more pollinators. Here at the office, we have service berry, plethora, lilac, flower, crab, blueberries, just to name a few. So, uh, and then he talked about the fact that this is a high use area in the, in the good weather months with recreation and uh, library use out there. So he said the program would be noticed by many. So we need the select board's permission. I don't see any downside really. This is unused land. 
Um, I believe they're going to do all the work in terms of getting it ready and prepared. Uh, so if you're inclined, a uh, motion could be made to allow this to happen. And if you don't want it, that's okay too. How large of a space is the actual garden going to be? Um, I'm not exactly sure. My I know there's a lot of area that's yeah, I, 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 I can't. I okay. don't know the square footage of it, but uh, you know, it's it's a it's a fair piece of property that doesn't have any real other use on it at this point, except part of it once in a while gets burned by the fire department. So. <laughs> right. We wouldn't have any maintenance. It's kind of like almost no. like planting wildflowers. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's nothing that we would have to maintain. Right. You have a hand up, Mike. Uh, Meg. Okay. Yes. Yep. Meg. Meg. Yep. Meg. Sorry about that. I wondered if, if Bill could show us the map, but just from the conversation, I'm understanding it would be like behind the library in the village. Is that what you're, or be the changes yeah. um, is what you're proposing? Yeah, I don't have the map available to put up on the. Uh, yeah, you should try it. It up the, <laughs> you probably put oh, it up okay. in the owl. Probably the owl. Oh, yeah. oh, right. <laughs> so I, have an, I have another question yeah. comment, too. This is really <laughs> Go ahead, Meg. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to say that I'm really familiar with Be the Change. I didn't realize this was on tonight, but. Um, I spend a lot of time in Boulder, Colorado, and Be the Change is really, really active out here. And it's um, something that I would love to have Waterbury be involved in. And what's cool with Be the Change is that you can start and then you can expand so that pollinators have, you know, gardens and areas that they can connect with in a really mindful way. So I just wanted to say out loud that um, in the past year or so, there's actually been a fair amount of discussion about pollinator gardens and areas up in Waterbury Center. And I just wanted to advocate that the Hope Davy Park um, would be an awesome, awesome spot to actually do a pollinator garden like the one that Be The Change is talking about. And then also, which dovetails into the work that the town is gonna do with a natural area, is that the natural area is in fact a whole pollinator area and has many, many opportunities to have those pollinator areas reinstated and restored. So I just wanted to say that and I think it's a great idea. Thank you, Meg. Hey. Um, yeah, I was just looking at the map. Uh, it does include a very steep embankment uh, which would not be appropriate for tilling. Um, but uh, I would guess that uh, they would understand that and only till the, the flat area. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, you know, this is the area that we've identified. I'll talk to Bill about that. Mm -hmm. the, the grade is steepest in here, I believe. And it flattens out as you go further. But uh, you know, we certainly won't let them do anything that's going to be dangerous. What's the process if um, approved going forward? Would they work with Bill? Yeah. 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 yeah, we would just let them know that we're the select board has approved it, and then we'll work with them. If there's a significant change to that plan, uh, you know, they may not use the whole area right. that we've outlined there. That's just a rough outline. I think it's yeah. a fairly straightforward project that will require us to be just involved in some of the planning. I don't think we're going to do right. the significant yeah. amount of the work. So. I'll move to uh, that we accept the proposal for the uh, Be the Change uh, request. Thank you. We have a second. One second. Thank you. Any further discussion on the be the change on request for pollinator? Is it one year or in perpetuity? Well, I think they're perennial, so it's so we'll going to be. Uh, perennial. I don't think they'll need to come in. No, they're perennial. Oh, perennial, sorry. Thank you. My gardening knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, though. 
Any other questions? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Can we just switch the reappointments and the CD fiber discussion? Just flip those, go to a point, uh, both Linda and Chris Shank first before we have a discussion on CB5. If no one has any objections. Okay. Um, we have two existing people who are on our delegates to CB5. Uh, Linda Gravel, she's the delegate, and Christopher Shank, he's their alternate delegate. They've both been active in, in the process. And um, I open it up for any, any discussions. I, know, I don't believe we've had any other known interest. So they are, we have to appoint them this month. Any questions for either Chris or Linda? I have a question. Sure. The CD fiber have a term have a term of your reappointment? It's like a uh, select board uh, appointment. Okay, so it would be to April thirtieth of twenty twenty three. So it's yearly, every year we would reappoint a, a delegate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And that would align it with other Yes. I didn't know if CB Fiber had their own thing going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any questions specifically? I know some of you were not on the board when we uh, previously had both Chris and Linda introduce themselves more formally. Well, Linda was here at the last meeting. So right. Uh, no, I'll move to uh, reappoint uh, both of them for one, the one year term of office. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? I will say as a point of information, we did not advertise these positions at all. That's who I know Carla has advertised for other boards and committees. We did not. Yeah. I know, I, no, and I understand, and I second and I support the motion. I think Lin Linda and Christopher have stepped up and are in the weeds, and we should reappoint them, but I just want to say as a process, I'm glad that we are aligning the terms, and then I would assume we could follow the same process as we do for our other boards and committees moving forward. But again, thank you, Linda and Chris, and <laughs> Point it's no, no. an honor to send <laughs> the residents of Waterbury to try to get them better attention now. It's a real honor. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, if there's no further discussions, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? None. Uh, they're both free appointed. Congratulations. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Uh, we did want to have, as a follow-up to our last discussion, and I probably want to hear from maybe Chris first, because we heard a lot from Linda at the, at the last meeting. You know, we did have some concerns about that the appropriation and what CV Fiber was doing was to create a whole nother network and not just reaching those that are underserved. Maybe Chris, if you could start off, because I know we, we spent a decent time. Sure, so. Yeah, yes, yes, we've worked um, quite a lot together. Uh, and I'm, I apologize for not being there. Um, I was under the weather this morning and I didn't want to bring anything in. So I apologize if I'm all stuffed up a bit, but. Um, Thank you, yeah, we appreciate so, that. I, I, <laughs> Um, I, I want to make it clear that CV Fiber does not have a single goal. Um, we have we have multiple goals, and and they're prioritized goals. And uh, and I think um, you know when when you look at all of the goals, and I'll touch on those in a second. Uh, you know, there's there's a sequence to them, and and there's some interdependencies between them. So the the goal that you're that you're referring to is is uh, bringing internet to the underserved community. So those individuals who, who have no internet service or, or very poor internet service options today, uh, the number one goal is to serve those individual homes. Um, however, that is not completely sustainable all by itself. You can't build out a multi-million dollar network 
um, to, to serve a handful of households. Um, so, you know, additional goals are to provide uh, competitive, high quality, high speed, reliable, inexpensive internet um, to the residents, to all residents of our member towns. Um, but obviously we wanna prioritize those uh, individual homes uh, who are underserved first. So when, you know, I'll, I'll try not to get too into the weeds here, but the, you know, there's a, there's a high level network design and then ultimately there's a, there's a, a detailed network design that needs to be built out. And you have to keep the end goal of serving everybody in mind. And you have to serve everybody if you want to make it make sense. You know, you have to, you have to be able to serve everybody um, in the end uh, to, to offer competitive services. So Comcast doesn't just get to charge whatever they want because they know you don't have a choice. Um, and so as we build the back backbones through the different areas, um, that those backbones are going to are going to cross neighborhoods that are perfectly served by Comcast or or consolidated. <clears throat> and should those uh, individual homes decide that they would like to pay to connect their service up, well, that would be an option for them. But ultimately, the goal for CV Fiber, we will be putting money first to build out internet service to those underserved communities. Does that answer the question? I'm happy to go into more detail if you like. Um, partially. Again, I think the, the big issue that was raised at the last meeting is looking at this is recreating a whole nother fiber network that we basically have in town with, you know, taxpayer support. You know, I don't mind in free enterprise, you know, a competitor looking at being another service and providing an alternative and hopefully being a competition. I think competition is good. But I think the concern that I think a, a lot of us portrayed is that we're not necessarily, we're recreating another whole network not necessarily reaching just to reach the underserved. And I think that's where taxpayer money is concerned. Bill, did you have? No, I just said it's $3 million for the 72 right. miles. Right? $3 million for, you know, the amount of, it's a, it's a lot of, you know, tax, taxpayer money that we're looking at doing, and I know you're looking at just $75,000, but some of the other grant money and stuff like that does wind up becoming taxpayer money in other ways, you know, via all of our taxes. Well, I mean, the, these funds are, these funds are, are coming from, you know, government grants and, and arguably from taxes, no matter what, and, right. you know, whether or not CV Fiber uses it to build out, uh, you know, internet access to underserved Vermont communities, or we, you know, we uh, fatten the wallets of the Comcast executives, you know, that that's ultimately up to the, the people who decide what they want to do. But, you know, the um, to say that there's already, you know, uh, um, fiber, yes, there, there's already fiber, but we can't, you know, if, if you if you really look at the single family dwellings that are underserved in, in the Waterbury, uh, you know, area, there's 86 homes. That's really what we're talking about, 86 homes. Now, um, it, it, it would not be sustainable if we were to build out a fiber network to serve 86 homes. That's just, that's just not realistic. So going back to the goals, the first goal, like I said, is to, is to build out service to those who are underserved. Um, but if we just had all, even if we had all 86 of those uh, underserved households paying for service, that's not sustainable. We need to continue going. And it's also not doing a service to the rest of, of the town of Waterbury who, you know, potentially are behind this. I mean, there's 86 single family dwellings that are underserved right now. Yet we had, uh, Linda, how many, how many uh, signatures do we have on the petition? Almost Way more than 150. 86. Almost 150. So, yeah. So nearly twice as many people signed it. So it's not just the underserved who are interested um, in 
you know, in this service. Um, you know, those those communities who are locked into a Comcast option uh, and Comcast, you know, Comcast doesn't care about your rates. They're going to raise them as as they can. Whereas an organization like CV Fiber, the the more uh, the more service that we build out, the lower the cost is for everybody. So if <clears throat> if if we grow and we bring our costs down. That's that's the whole point of a CUD is is to pass that savings on directly to the subscriber. So not only are we serving the underserved, uh, but we're providing very valuable competition in the area and 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 forcing those you know large uh, telecommunications companies to to be honest. <clears throat> Um, Chris, I'm wondering, you talk about what would be sustainable, um, I'm wondering what is your model? How many subscribers uh, do you expect to have to have to have a sustainable uh, system and what would be the rates, the monthly rates for those uh, subscribers? Those are always the questions that we, that we get. Um, so those those specific numbers are, are kind of uh, you know guarded secrets um, you know within for for you know competitive reasons we can't we can't get those um, you know give those out I can I can tell you we're not going to be charging twenty dollars a month um, and we're not going to be charging two hundred dollars a month you know so it's going to be um, somewhere in be I'm sorry that would be a range twenty to two hundred I mean Which yeah I mean. That's, I, uh, you know, yeah, now. but uh, you know, it's it's, it's going to be somewhere in between there. And obviously, the goal is to get is to get the rates as low as possible. And so, you know, as CV Fiber um, is really starting this year, you know, we're going to have we're going to have subscribers. Our first subscribers go live uh, later this year. So at first, we're going to be working off of those off of the grant money. Um, you know, the money that that uh, that we have in the bank today. Um, and at, at some point, there's going to be a transition from using that grant money um, to, you know, to move on to subscriber rates. But I, I can't speak to the, the specific details and the numbers of, of subscribers. And um, uh, I, I am on the finance committee, but I don't have all those numbers uh, memorized, nor do I know exactly which ones are for public knowledge. Cool. So, uh, Chris, you know, maybe... Maybe you would have had it if you had been able to come tonight. Um, one of the questions that I had was, you know, is there a map that we can see? You've got it? They sent us with the okay. first batch last All week. All right, so there is a map, so I apologize. You've, you've got a map. But, I can, no, no, that's fine. Um, those are the underserved. Right. So, so how, much of the, how much of the 72 miles is going to have to be built in order to serve the 86 single family properties. Do you know that? I don't have that specific number um, because this the $75,000 that we're talking about is not to build out that network. Those those funds are being allocated through through grants. The $75,000 that we are asking for of ARPA funds um, gets us halfway to building out um, the the drop, you know, the the final run, basically from that backbone to the house. And we need about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to do that for these eighty six homes. Um, and you know, because of the match, you know, if we if if there's still funds available, um, if Waterbury were to commit seventy five thousand. The match will get us to that 150,000, and then we will be able to build those drops out. Okay. So I want to turn back to Linda. Did I understand you correctly last week or two weeks ago, Linda, at the last meeting? You said that there's already fiber that's up Ring Road that serves all of the public highway Ring no, Road. Not CV fiber. Comcast. One of the Comcast. Yes, Comcast. 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 Yeah. So I, I learned that from one of the owners up there. All right. So Ring Road is a private road. I mean, is a public highway. And I thought Ring Road wasn't served, but if if you're correct, you're telling us that there's already fiber 
on Ring Road. So are we, are we asking to use public money to bring a drop from the public highway up somebody's private driveway to their house? Well, I'm not on the board, but to no. me, that's like, really? I, I hear Bill loud and clear. I kind of feel the same way, is especially you use the, the Ring Road as an example. Most of those people of a, are of means, and you know if if this was more of a low income, you know. You can specify that part. with your grant money. You can specify if you only want people of means. Yeah. 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 That we could specify that the grant money only to use for underserved people who qualify under some low-income test. That's right. You can actually add to the, remember I gave you a list mm -hmm. of different things that you could, um, they're just suggestions by those, but you can specify whatever you want the money to go for. If you want it to go for jobs for low-income people, if you wanted to go for jobs with children that are in school, for example, who are not on the internet or have no quality internet right now, you can make a specification on exactly how you want the money used. If you want to put money toward the backbone, if you want to put money toward the drops, whatever you want to put money for. But then, going back to where our original discussion was going, we talked about you know a whole new fiber network. And I have no problem funding in our town people who are underserved, who don't have internet options. I guess we have a little bugle. Uh, but I do have an issue with funding people of means who, you know, I don't, want, I don't think we should subsidize. They made choices by living where they did, and I think that's kind of, it is is a public policy issue. So and and also ARPA ARPA funds. It's not like I know everyone hears ARPA. They think ARPA money money's going, you know, is going to be everywhere. There's only going to be a certain amount of money, and we're going to have a lot of priorities for that ARPA those ARPA funds. So that that's what concerns me. Um, well, we're not asking for a lot of money uh, at $75,000, so you can't specify exactly how you wish it to be spent. Mm -hmm. okay. I would say both of your concerns, Mike, I think we could address mm -hmm. if we decide to, as we decide to move forward, regardless of what we decide. The concern being where the money goes is something we have control over to make decisions, and um, the concern about the amount of money. You know, we can specify if it's a $75,000 ask. We decide to move forward with that. That's the cap that we put on. It's a one-time grant towards CB or one-time allocation to a CB fiber for this amount. So I don't think I still think we all have a lot of questions, but in terms of those two large concerns, they're very manageable things that we can mm -hmm. deal with. <clears throat> I would echo Danny. And just speaking for myself, I think it still continues to be interesting. Candidly, I don't have enough information tonight to make. A determination on us awarding the funds, I would say holistically, as has been brought up, and I know we have two items on the agenda later this evening. A more holistic conversation about ARPA is certainly something on my mind, as opposed to one off connections. I want to be respectful of Linda and Chris. I would say that, again, I personally do not feel ready to vote on this particular $75,000 allocation, in particular because it does require, and Linda, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, when we commit the funding, if we were to choose to do so, we would have to give those specifications about, I have the stuff you have from last week about, you know, drops and who it does and things like that. So I feel like I don't feel ready to address the question of if we're committing right. the funding, and I certainly wouldn't feel ready to address the question of even more specifically how the funding is. So I, again, appreciate Chris and Linda, and I see Tom has a hand too, so maybe we'll get to him. Um, I know it is first come, first serve. I don't know if you have updates on if other towns have chosen to pursue the matching funds, um, but otherwise, personally, I feel like I would need more time and information before I'm able to write to make a decision. Roger, before we go to Tom, do you have any further input? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I recognize that uh, in the 21st century, uh, having cable access or having access to internet is really uh, a requirement uh, for to, to function uh, for all uh, purposes, and so I, I support the effort. Um, I, well, I really question whether there's a constituency here, though. Signing that petition really does not say that you're going to be ready and willing to, to sign up for uh, C.D. Piper uh, cable. All it says is that you support going forward with this initiative, and I saw lots of known names on that list of people that have no particular interest themselves but want to support the initiative. So what I'd be interested in would be if you could come forward with a, a constituency of people saying, we're underserved, uh, we're qualified for the uh, uh, low income equity program, and that we would appreciate the town's support in getting this access. If that was something that you were able to put together, then I'd be much more interested in supporting this initiative. Thank you, Roger. Right now, we do not have a way to qualify people for low income. That has not been established yet in the state of Vermont. It is mm -hmm. under investigation right now, but it's going to be months, months before really it comes to fruition about how to, make, how to go through the process, how to do an application for, uh, for low income, how to be qualified for low income. That might take a year or more, and the funds, the matching funds will be gone by then. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. I, I cannot offer you a, the list of those who qualify for, for those restrictions. Um, I can, uh, and the list of unserved is, uh, is not available to the public. I have given you the addresses on the map, so you have an idea of the different locations, but I really can't give you the list of constituents that is uh, private information Linda wouldn't it be because I know no. I've worked a lot with um, low-income populations managing programs wouldn't it just be based upon their tax returns and you would have some sort of a percent I of guess, but I, I, I'm, I'm only guessing Mike um, I would guess but I don't even know if they've determined that yet uh, the EC right. Fiber is working on this. Uh, her name is Holly Grishner. And I think I gave um, her email and the website for that in the papers I gave you folks. Um, if, if you want more information about what's, how, how they're proceeding. Because uh, I knew you'd be interested, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Tom, Tom's been waiting patiently. Tom, do you want to uh, add something? Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. Thank you. Um, redundancy came up at the last meeting, and I take that as meaning there's going to be a separate cable below what already exists on the telephone lines. So there's an aesthetic component to that where many views are already impacted by lines on poles. And to add another one, have to consider that. Um, another thought as I sit here is that we're talking about Comcast in sort of a negative way, and they are the vehicle at the moment, but CV Fiber describes itself as a multi-million dollar organization, and I'm just curious what the uh, CEO salary is for uh, CV Fiber. We don't have a CEO. Well, you're you're trying to hire one. That's my understanding. We we just hired an executive director. Okay, same difference. What's the salary? Oh, uh, I don't know if that's public knowledge either. To tell you the truth, it is. It, so it, it is public. Um, and yeah, it, it was available out, out yeah. on the. Yeah, the the salary range for that position is between one hundred and one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Okay, that's quite a bit above the poverty line. So you know you got to. If you're serving the end of the serve, you, you're going to have to market a little better. Thanks, Thanks Tom, Thank you. for your input. Any other? Uh... I have one more question, Linda. Did you learn any more about the application process? I remember at the last meeting, we weren't clear on whether who would be actually submitting the application. Um, and the timeline for that. Did you learn any more about that or know where we could find it? For committee funds? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
specify that we want our money used for to provide service for underserved households that meet a certain income criteria not a, a full build out would that be would that be something that we could do I think you can, um, um. so I, th yeah. I think that you know and there are a lot of municipalities out there in, in Vermont, hundreds. You know, we've got 251 cities and towns, and then there are, you know, innumerable villages. There's fire districts right across the river. Uh, Duxbury Moortown Fire District Number One was organized to to to, uh, to build a, a water system because the private company that ran a water system over there couldn't afford to raise the rates to the level that he needed in order to do that. So the folks over there created a municipality and they used the, the public laws in order to uh, finance the construction of a system and they probably went to US rural development yep. to, to get uh, a loan to, to build that out. And uh, you know, they, they use the full faith and credit of the grand list of that, uh, those areas in that community to, to float that bond. And then they paid the note back with revenues that they generated from uh, selling water to their customers. Uh, we belong to Capital Fire District Mutual Aid, which is a municipality that has a purpose to provide dispatching services for public safety organizations that don't have the wherewithal to, to do it themselves. So the city of Montpelier has 24-7 dispatching that they dispatch their police, fire, and ambulance with. 
but that, you know, to have 24-7 dispatching, you need the equipment and you need enough people, and it's a half a million dollars to do that. Mm -hmm. So our town and other towns in this community got together and created that uh, municipality capital fire mutual aid, and you know we pay sixty-five thousand dollars a year to get dispatched. In this case, um, and I think this is uh, this is where I think maybe we crossed paths at the beginning of this process, where and I'm, I'm not advocating for or against anything right now, but I'm just trying to put it in context. I think when when we advertised for delegates to CV Fiber, uh, it was to serve the unserved and the underserved. And I think there was an expectation, I'll only speak for me, but that there was going to be a way to use this municipality to reach out the backbone, if you will, of the system to areas that the private companies didn't think was worth going to. So Compact, Comcasts and Consolidated need a certain number of people per mile or however they do their calculus and they say, well, if there's only three houses every four miles, we're not going to run a cable out there because it costs us this much to do it and there's only so much revenue at the end of the line. So I think that there was maybe an expectation on part of the former select board that we were going to be joining this to try to get cable to places where it didn't reach now. And you could do that in a couple of different ways, right? You could go to Comcast and to Consolidated and say, how much is it to run a cable out XYZ Road to serve those however many customers? You won't do it because there's not enough uh, revenue at the end of the line to pay for your infrastructure. But if we paid for the infrastructure, and then all you have to do from now on is to service the cable, fix it if it breaks, then it, it's worth it for them. So I think we, we're maybe You're talking in... You're describing a monopoly here. What's that? You're describing a monopoly here. Well, I don't think there's a monopoly. There's two companies that provide the service right now. I'm just trying to say that I think there was some expectation that we were going to help build cable to places where it doesn't exist. And that CV fiber running a whole network was not necessarily in, in our calculus. I'm not saying it's a wrong thing to do. Because certainly, you know, I'd love to pay a lower cable bill that I pay now. But I think we're talking about using the numbers that Linda gave us last week, $3 million to build 72 miles of cable, which would allow uh, CB Fiber, whoever they are, to offer service to everybody. So it's a $3 million subsidy to CB Fiber to get their, their system out there, and now they can compete with two companies that have already done most of this. So I'm not saying it's wrong, it's just, I, I think that's where the rub for me and maybe some of the uh, people who had asked that question last week, so. At least I'm hearing now there's, we have no consensus to go forward, at least today. Uh, what I would recommend is that each one of the select board members address questions to uh, Chris and Linda, and you know, I don't know if, if we'd be ready at the next board meeting to have you know, a vote. I know you, you expressed some hesitancy to go forward today. Well, I guess, so just two points I would make is, one, I think on this $3 million, I'm not on any side of it, but I, the ask to Waterbury taxpayers is $75,000 of ARPA funding. They're a municipality. They can't touch our tax money otherwise. So I just want to say, like, whether you think that's a good use of federal funds, we could come up with whatever use of federal funding. The $3 million is separate federal funding they're going to pursue. And our question is around our ARPA money. So that's really the lane I'm trying to be in. I will say, I was at the meeting where we just voted to join CB Fiber, and Dwayne Peterson came in and said, among other things, 
the state is pumping a lot of money into broadband through grants. Wouldn't it be great if my home mun municipality of Waterbury could be part of taking advantage of that? And I just want to say, like, that was part of what he came and the board at the time voted. So, um, again, I mean, I think I want to be respectful of Chris and Linda. I think if we do want to move forward at the next meeting, I think we probably need to have a little more coordination between are we as a board creating criteria around, I feel like this underserved thing keeps coming up as something where maybe there is some consensus. Um, so is it that we would support a potential allocation? I think that's, again, there's kind of the two buckets. It's are we going to CB fiber? And then if we're going to CB fiber with what specific strings attached? Um, and I don't know if we have consensus on either of those questions. Um, yeah, and agree, it's something that I do want to point out is like, I went back to read some of the materials from those original meetings when we, the former board, board voted to move forward, and these numbers were in there. Like three million dollars was in there. The the length of time has gotten longer. Obviously, if things have changed throughout with supply chain, et cetera, et cetera, and cost. But um, so I think something that I want to do is maybe forward to you to some of those original materials that you may not have been able to see when we did vote, knowing that we voted to go forward, we elected these um, folks to, to represent us with CB Fiber, just seeing you know, what we made the decision based on to help us move forward. Um, if we want to, so hard without discussing, but I think that you know, the two big questions are, are what you said, do we want to move forward with voting on allocating the ARPA funds and what are those means, or what are those restrictions? I think it's important to know that like the restrictions that we might come up with, uh, you know, Chris was suggesting information that's available now, like um, uh, home, uh, what was it, the value, the home value. I don't know that we're gonna be able to ask CB Fiber to ask for people's income. Like, I don't, there's there's restrictions around those kinds of things, and that that, that just might not be feasible. So, um, as much as we love to put some of those restrictions, we might, we need to think about information like home value or something that's, you know, accessible. You can, for, I know I've worked for, 31 years dealing with federal programs, if you have a qualification, you could ask for in income. Right, but it's CB5 or not us. I know. So that's... But I think, I think they, they can. Well, because if it's a qualifying thing, they, they could ask My for... My point is I just don't want to assume. I want to make sure. So if we're going to make a, a requirement, I want to right. follow, be able to back it up. I can't believe that you can't ask for some income documentation for any kind of municipal program because otherwise say, oh my income is $30,000 a year. I don't believe any program runs on something that someone states that they say that and even if they sign, you know, kind of an affidavit. Not disagree. I don't disagree. I just need yeah. to find out. Make yeah. sure. And as a person who's filled out 19 pages of paperwork for one of those programs, <laughs> they're not a low lift. And I just want to say, like, so if right. I also, I mean, I'm back to what Linda provided us at the first meeting. So this was a number, again, because we need to fill out the thing right. on summary of where the investment would go. This says the average cost to connect each address is estimated at $17,050. Estimated cost connect all underserved households, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is saying to connect only the single family dwellings is $150,000. So again, we have this. Yeah. Is that the 75 plus the 75 match? But one of, one of those one of those houses doesn't want it. Um, I, again, I think we need a little more information about if we allocate it and then there isn't a use. Does it go to general build-out? Go ahead, Bill. Well, I just, again, you, 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 again, again I just wonder. Yeah. We should specify that. If, 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 one of the houses doesn't qualify for, let's say, the property values that you specify as the as data the point, then you should specify where you want the money to go otherwise. Like, you wanted to make sure it goes in town along stringing the cable or, or do the design, detailed design for water barrier, mm -hmm. or, you know, there's, there's a lot of construction type things that have to go on in the water barrier. That you could say, if it doesn't meet the criteria here, move it into this other bucket. Clear, I mean, you folks are the select board and you have the determination. Uh, and maybe it's that I've just spent too much time managing water yeah. and sewer systems, you know, which are utilities, public utilities. Spending $75,000 of ARPA funds to help build the network 
Now, if they talked about the $3 million, and if they talked about that they're going to build a duplicate network back when, when they first came here, and I missed that, I apologize. And if that, I, I'm not against that. I'm just wanting to make sure that we all understand that's what is happening. From my perspective, I think building a network, building the infrastructure is certainly the purview of a municipality. Running it from the public right of way up any driveway or, I don't care if it's 10 feet or 3,000 feet, I'm not sure it's the public's responsibility to get the line to where the house is. But that's that, so this is clarifying for me. That's so usually the I case with high water that. systems. Yeah, you're, that's you're, absolutely. You're required to get to the joint. As a matter of fact, uh, I believe that uh, most utilities offer 600 feet, which is not going to make it for the underserved that we have. Well, I think we've passed this to, to death. Um, I think we have some information. If anyone has specific questions for uh, Linda or Chris, you know, we have their emails. And uh, I think with some, a little bit of research, we may be able to ready to come to some consensus maybe at the next meeting. Are we there? I would like to recommend that you send our question, your questions to waterbury at cbfiber.net because Christopher and I both uh, get that email. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay. And I, I do appreciate all the interest that you are showing and that you are asking all the right questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Chris. We really appreciate your service to the community. Thanks. Thanks. Move on to the next agenda item, uh, uh, discussing select board priorities for 2022. What's your pleasure? I'll, I'll ask my fellow board members, maybe we'll go around each one, what they see is what priorities for, for this coming year. Sure, and I'll say in general, I asked to have this on the agenda because I think it's important to have kind of a general framing conversation. I think we um, certainly have plenty to do in terms of just kind of, you know, obviously the priority is supporting how we can the municipality and things moving forward. Um, we talked about last week, the manager search is going to be huge and I don't want to, um, I know that's going to be time and resources, um, so that certainly is on my radar, something that's important. We also all got the email about um, this recreation study, so again, that's a time sensitive. What did you say was the first one? Municipal manager search um, as the top priority. Um, I guess the piece that I alluded to a little earlier tonight was around ARPA funding. Obviously, we have that later on the agenda as its own thing, but I would just say, in my mind, kind of akin to CV Fiber, there's like two things, which is one, just I, you know, I understand we have staff already working on making sure we're meeting whatever requirements we need to meet, but then I guess in my mind it's a conversation about like input and strategic planning, which is, um, you know, do we do we as a board want to solicit input? Some towns have done committees, some have focused it on a topical issue with a variety of programs. We could do a bunch of random programs, you know. Again, it's not to make a commitment, but I think at least personally I'm interested in having a broader conversation about the opportunity of the ARPA funding and what we want to do about it and if it wants to be on a topic. Um, and I guess the only other piece, again, that's like a full plate, so I want to be clear. I don't I don't think we have time to like do a million things, but the one other piece I would say, just as someone in particular who's about to resign from the planning commission, I do think um, thinking about our relationships with our various boards and committees um, is important. And just to say, as I just said, my intention is to resign from the planning commission. I know we've advertised positions and we'll work on appointing them, but we also have num numerous other boards and commissions. I know you all met with some of them during budgeting, but figuring out um, if and how we as a select board want to relate to them and incorporate them in our work. And one I would just name in particular that doesn't exist, but I think you all did approve is housing. Um, if I can add more things, but just to say, a housing committee has been talked about and that's certainly of interest for me. So I know that's more than enough for a year, which is why I <laughs> brought it up in terms of us all needing to have a conversation, but that's just a few thoughts. We're going to have to meet every week. I'm game. I was really concerned about my Monday nights. I'm game. <laughs> Roger. 
Um, I think Alyssa hit the highlights. Um, as I understand it, our primary function is to uh, take care of the uh, town's finances and uh, how we spend our money. So I'd be most interested in anything having to do with that. Um, and but um, yeah, I think that. Uh, those are the big ones for me. Um, one of our constituents uh, brought up the conditions of the road, uh, which is a seasonal issue, but a serious one. Um, so that may be something that we need to hear a bit more about. Okay. Yeah, the, so the two big pieces for me was I'm really looking forward to the conversation about our administration and compliance to learn more. Um, I think, you know, Mike, you expressed that concern of, of like, it seems like a really big, it is a really big amount of money, um, and but it will go away. So um, I think rather than, you know, just uh, playing it by ear, we have that uh, conversation uh, soon and think about priorities and also how we want to learn about our priorities and the town um, community priorities. Um, and then uh, boards and committees is something that I also talked to Melissa about um, over the past year. I tried to attend at least one commission or board meeting for each group, and I think I'd, I'd love to talk more about, well, more with all of us about how we want to go about trying to be more um, present, knowing that, you know, the time is, is super valuable and stretched thin, but um, just seeing uh, the interest and availability of, of having an ear and a voice and, um, you know, being a part of those meetings a little bit more going forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm much like most of you. Uh, big, pri big priorities are one is the manager search. I think I can't, you know, underestimate how important that is that we kind of get that. That's kind of our going into our next topic. But then also, I hope you can't overestimate. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's going to be hard filling those shoes. I'm not going to pull any punches. You know. You know, high-level job searches are no fun. And to get the right person, you know, hopefully we're going to have another person that's going to be here for 34 years. But in this kind of job economy, if we get someone for 10 years, I think I'd be very happy. Uh, I'm also very much in tune with the whole ARPA uh, process. I think it's really important that we kind of, you know, there's, there's a lot of money, but it's easy to spend, you know, you start spending money and it, it's going to go. We have a bunch of money already with eFud, you know, that's kind of, you know, already, you know, spent. I do encourage all the board members, as I sent to you, there's going to be the ARPA training on DLCP. I encourage you. We had on, as Alyssa, in the select board essentials, e e even if it's the same thing, they went through a lot pretty fast, and it's something that we have to keep our eye on the ball. I'm really concerned about that. Thank you for several of you who brought up the thing. It's one of my priorities is to attend every board and, co and commission, and kind of not a planned visit that I'm going to come, just kind of show up and say, uh, uh, and I will also not only boards and commissions, I would like to meet with some like the highway department and stuff like that, just say, hey, what are your concerns? You know, you know, what do you want from a select board? I think that's really, really important. This is not just the boards and commissions. It's a lot of the, uh, I, I know it may infringe a little bit upon, I don't think it's going to infringe upon Bill's responsibility. I think he does a great job managing staff, but I think we should hear from, from them on what their concerns and, and where, where they are. Uh, I, too, and I don't know if we're going to get to it this year, it is the housing study. I think it would be good to have, you know, RW present the housing study that they have done and bring that to us. But, you know, that's a real big egg to bite. And the other thing, which one thing that hasn't been mentioned, we probably need to discuss in addition to Bill's leaving, and the possible, you know, merge with E5. Do we want to go forward with charter? You know, I have mixed opinions on should we go 
go forward with the charter, but at least I think with the change, we probably need to maybe have some direction there. I'll shut my mouth. Bill, do you have anything that well, yeah. you feel that we haven't? No, I just, I just want to remind everyone, and it's kind of, you know, get used to the cycle, but for uh, Alyssa and Roger in particular, um, the, the information gathering that you do now will inform the 2023 budget. And, you know, we're in a situation where, you know, Mike and Danny and Chris and Mark Fryer and Katie worked. And so 2022 is kind of prioritized uh, in terms of what we have to spend. It doesn't mean that we, that we can't spend some time talking about things, but it's just the first priority for the manager and staff right now is to execute what the select board and the voters told us that we're going to do. So, you know, we're going to, in the next couple of weeks, get together the, you know, the RFP out for the, for the planning study for the Hope Davy Park and for the Ice Center site to do the master planning that we talked about last year with members of the community. Um, it's not on the agenda tonight. I'd like you to start thinking about, you know, uh, the, the RFP that Steve and Nick uh, are working on and will ultimately finalize with me. You know, has a provision in it that there'll be a, a steering committee appointed by the select board to help review the, uh, the submissions from whatever consultants uh, decide to uh, submit uh, a proposal for the RFP, and then also to help guide the consultant as we go out and you know look at these sites and gather this information. So you know, I'm not going to ask you to appoint the committee tonight. Uh, this will probably be on the agenda for the 18th, uh, the next meeting, and we'll go from there. So anyway, uh, there's plenty of things to do with regard to housing, just so you know. I had a uh, conference call uh, with the folks from Down Street. Uh, they're, you know, they're a not-for-profit that does a lot of housing, profit, uh, housing projects in the state. They've got the Lab Hall property here, they've got the Stimson and Graves building, they're involved with the uh, seminary building, all three of which are housing projects. They are uh, interested in uh, uh, another project in Waterbury in the relatively near future. Certainly nothing will, you know, their information gathering and trying to identify how they might secure sites is what they're talking about right now. They are interested in both the 51 South Main Street site and the um, well, Stanley Wasson Hall site, where we originally had proposed to build this facility back after the flood. So we'll continue to work with them. Uh, Kathy Byer has got a meeting this week, I think, with uh, Josh Shanford, who's now the Commissioner of Housing and Community Affairs. And, um, and the people at BGS to talk about uh, Stanley Hall Lawson site. So housing is clearly a priority. I think it's been identified by the previous select board. Uh, for your information, the new board members, uh, we did invite and have a couple of folks from um, down the street here last summer. They toured. Uh, Waterbury looked at several potential sites, and they're excited about trying to partner with the community to do something else there. So, maybe. okay, thanks. Just want to add: Does anyone in the audience, either on Zoom or in in the room, have any further comments on? Did we miss any glaring omissions that we have on what our priorities for 2022? Tom, hard to see. You're in a little bit of the I, dark. Yeah, yeah, I'm in the dark a lot. Um, thanks. Uh, I just have a policy question. Um, in the past year, there were several times that people uh, 
identified themselves as, as board members or board chairs, and then shared their opinions on social media. And I think it gets, uh, when people see it on social media, then they question if the person is expressing a personal opinion or board, a board opinion. So I'm just wondering if there is a town policy on as board members, how you present in your opinions on social media. Thanks. And anyone have my opinions on Tom's question? We'll have to dust I, off the social media policy. <laughs> I, yeah, it was written in 1992. I try to stay off of social media for the most part. And and I, I always look at everything in the eye of the town first, not Mike Bard. And I just believe in that. I, you know, even though I have my personal opinions, I always look at, especially in the eye of people who have less means in this community and making them as whole as possible. That's probably the only, th only thing I'll look toward, you know, is keeping taxes at a, a moderate rate so people could afford to stay in our community versus leave. Otherwise, you know, maybe that's, if you call that a personal opinion, but I think that's a town-related kind of thing. Otherwise, I look at, hey, we, we, have, we have everything. We can't even speak the, the four of us, four of us here, we can't even have an outside conversation if, if, if it involves anything but having a glass of wine or a beer, you know. I, mean, I, think, Tom, I think Tom was specifically asking about a, a, a policy that the town has regarding our use of social media, and Bill was confirming we do have one. I don't think any of us have it in front of us or know it. I can email it to you. But it can be, yeah, we can get it, have it emailed, Tom, so that we can it's all... Probably, it's probably on our website. Does it speak to the board? I was going to say, I think it's oriented at employees. It's on the employees or municipal page, if I'm remembering correctly. Right. I guess, yeah. I so mean, it might it, not be one for boards or commissions. Yeah, sure. Well, so basically, board oh, no. issues are not discussed on social media by individuals representing themselves as as board members, is that right? Well, I don't think there's a policy about that. It's well, you have to, in my opinion, you're going to carry more weight in what you say because people will say, well, you know, he's speaking for the town. So I think you just got to be careful because maybe you are, maybe you aren't. I say it here. That's it's on public record, and everything we say here is public record. So I think that's, I, I just think social media can be, to me, my personal opinion, can be dangerous in, in, in these. So I try to, unless I'm on Facebook, but I'm on Facebook among for my, you know, friend, distant friends all around the country. But other than that, I really stay off of social media. Okay, well, if, if there is a policy, I would like to see it. But uh, anyways, thank you. Yeah, I think, it, as Bill said, I think it's for employees. Waterburyvt.com under plans and policies. Right. But that's different. Yeah. that's different than municipal representatives. Right. And I think Danny said we don't have a policy. I want to know, but we can look into it. We can look into it and then go from there. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Maybe we could take a look at the uh, the municipal policy and then take it up at the next meeting sure. and uh, decide if we want to. We can put that in the parking lot for next meeting. I think we, we might want to have a policy of not representing our, uh, our personal the, views. Our personal views as coming from the as select board members. Well said. Mm -hmm. Anything else on that? If not, we're 13 minutes late. I'm trying to get Skip home for the basketball game. We're going to move on to uh, a discussion of. Uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns are municipal manager, manager search. Want to come on now? Uh, 15 uh, minutes uh, late is close enough for government. <laughs> Don't give us too much time. You were skeptical about 8 o'clock. I was saying we might make it, but we're close. Um, well, thank you for having it on the agenda and thank Carla for getting here, here, I was a little late. <laughs> um, Call me in the parking lot. I'm getting to take the afternoon off. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, 
And if you remember, I was here, or our whole board was here after the fact uh, last meeting where we uh, talked about this and each board agreed to go forward with the LTC uh, contract. I couldn't imagine trying to do it alone and things, and we agreed to uh, each appoint two people to a search committee of things. And uh, up until that point, EFA had not seen the draft contract, and Danny emailed it to us, which was the first. Uh, we had seen it, and uh, I had emailed back to Danny and, and Mike uh, that I was going to uh, send it to each of our EFA members and ask for their comments and questions. And I made sure with Bill, too, that if we did that in a way that we were violating any meeting or anything. Is that the the contract? Yeah. I never, re I never received that. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, it's fine. I think it was on the last half of the last day. Sorry. Sorry. Nope, no problem. So I didn't want uh, communications all about it that we can get in trouble with uh, the meeting law. So I emailed it to them and had each one of them email their comments to me. Um, and I've compiled them tonight that I'm going to share with you and suggested to uh, Mike and Danny that the select board have their comments and questions available for tonight. Um, so with that, I'm going to share, I can pass those around. Um, yeah, I just would try to yeah. rock if you, you have a copy of the... Uh, I, if I uh, received it, I didn't, okay. didn't I recognize it. I, I just want to be candid. I don't I think we received it before tonight, or I haven't well, seen it yet. No, that's I thought it was the open meeting law that Danny might have sent it separately. So. I thought I did. Here it is. So then I feel fortunate to get my copy. <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. You want the special um, one last week. I will note that at the back of it, it said there were some documents that went with it that I that weren't attached to it. So I haven't seen uh, you know the uh, uh, at the back they said there was some this uh, community profile and some other things that that weren't attached to it but they're not important. These are the summary of all our EFA uh, commissioners and things. Um, universally, we thought it was generally a uh, laid out the good steps and things, and we really, uh, you know, appreciate um, you know them doing that. Uh, one of the first comments was it needed to be revised to reflect that it's contract with EFUD as well as the select board that, um, you know, it, they didn't uh, do that in the beginning there and things. Um, and now we can walk through the, uh, but I put the comments together sort of like a page. Um, and their first comment was uh, on the timetable. Um, I think it's uh, page five here. Uh, and in the front, they said step one and step two were one to two weeks um, to prepare uh, advertising plans and the thing, the draft job description and the pay rates and position profile. And um, I checked with Bill, and I don't think we have a job description for the manager, either as the EFUD manager or the town manager. Um, and even if we had one from the days we hired, it would not be close to what the job is today. So um, none of the EFUD folks have time to work on that job description and things that I assume we're going to ask for it to be prepared by VLTC. I don't know if that's something they're going to want to do or well, I think that would have been part of their responsibility. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that we, as we spoke last night on the phone, I think 
the town manager by statute has certain roles and responses. And I think de facto, that's kind of our job description for forbidden. Well, I don't think that's good enough to Oh, I no, no, I understand going forward, that's not a good thing. We should have a more customized thing and we should have well, it should fit Waterbury, because Waterbury is different than any other community. Right. Many but there are some things that are just by statute that the town manager has to do and not well, those are more sort of authorities and things rather than a description of what it's going to take to do the job. Right. You know, and I think part of our point is to clarify that, yes, they're going to do that, you know, and... I don't think one to two weeks is adequate time to do that, to have it looked at by us, to be sure we've included all the jobs that EFUD has, that the town has. Um, so, they, so, so to answer your question, it is part of what they do. Right. Job description for the, for the position needs to be updated as the very first step in the process. Um, you know, it's work, they said, you know, in conjunction with the select board, to formally vote and approve the updated job description. So 100% it'll be done in conjunction, and then we all will vote to approve it before they put it out. So the question is what, you know, the timing or well, stuff. Well, one right? to two weeks right. is not, to, and you know, we've been through, some of us have been through things like this with merger and weeks, and when they slip, they become months, and pretty soon. Um, but in defense, I think, Vermont League of Cities and Towns, this ain't their first rodeo. And they've been through these, and I'm not saying we are unique in a lot of ways, but I think they could get a raw template, and then with input from the committee, I think they could decide. All right, and how long is the committee going to take to get their parts in? I, I'm just saying this is not, I don't think this is adequate to keep us on I understand, I understand correctly. And they haven't heard anything from us. No. I don't know who who talked to them to put the contract together. Was that Mark or I guess Mark? Yeah, Mark. this is just the um, like the proposal contract. So like this, we haven't signed anything. That's we haven't had that first yeah, meeting. Yeah, I understand. So I mean, I think, and we talked about having that first meeting, so we can express and also ask questions. I don't know whether it's one to two weeks and then it's move on regardless. You know that I think this is a suggested time frame, and if it takes and out of week, you know. But I don't, it's some conversation I have with them. I'm just assuming based upon they have experience, I know it's tough, but the committee's gonna also have to take some responsibility to try to, I know how things sometimes are hard, maybe it is a little short, but Give overall that. we can't keep on moving this process down the road because ultimately we're not gonna have a town manager and Bill's gonna be retired. <laughs> Well, I'm not saying we need to move it around the road, but what the contract we sign needs to be predictable and Absolutely. that we can keep on track. And I haven't heard that from, well, I haven't talked to them, and I think EFUD has concerns that that's not an adequate time right. to keep us on track. So that's... And maybe that's some questions for our first meeting. Right, then. that's what I think. Well, I, yeah, I, when I get to the end, uh, I've got some suggestions, too, for what we do here. Um, on page six, they have the estimate of the uh, you know, cost, and this was prepared January 28th. The world is a different place <laughs> now than it was on the 28th, um, certainly in the price of gas and things, and some of the people um, that commented wondered whether these are you know accurate costs for today like even renting a car is a hundred bucks and they've got a hundred to a thousand dollars for travel and that it just needs to be looked at to be sure that it's uh, accurate for the conditions we're uh, things um, we also had a you know, what's the customized training at 450 with an asterisk? Is that per hour? Is that for the board, the select search committee? Or, you know, what, what does that entail? I think that they put that there. It's often the custom training. It's 
the four manager and select board roles and responsibilities. So I think they have a specific training class that they would provide. No. Um, yeah. I'm not sure, but, um, you know, and further on, they talk about uh, training and determining what, uh, what are the confidentiality rules that we want to follow in doing this. I think, you know, my personal opinion, we need some training in what, what are the confidentiality options for doing this and what are the advantages or disadvantages of each that we need to kind of set up in interviewing these um, people in the advertising here. So I don't know if they've included uh, I think having, opportunity to do having that. Having been on hiring boards, I think pretty much is the committee you can't say anything. You know, you, you're in there and... That's why well, I know there are questions you can't ask. Right. But, but know, I don't some think, people I don't, don't think, want I don't you to know that they've even applied. Right. But I don't think outside the committee that really things are discussed outside the committee. I think it's discussed that that's what we're appointing EFUD commissioners and select board representatives and you know as we talked yesterday we probably want to have at a meeting of with with the LCP do we want to have a representative from 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 the you know from the public mm -hmm. beyond that on that and before I want to commit to that mm -hmm. I would like to hear what the pros and cons from VLCP I think they could probably add, add a lot to that mm -hmm. And they can also recommend uh, the, the confidentiality right. uh, exactly. options that Skip was suggesting. Um, I think they'll be able to answer a lot of the questions that are on. Well, here. yes, but these what are the questions have? we want to have addressed before we sign a contract. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to explain what it is and be reasonably sure we can meet the schedules and what our obligations are under it um, mm -hmm. and things. So, um, and the, they mentioned a time table here. Um, I think Which we're going to, we would ask for a uh, you, once the contract is signed and we know what the steps are, um, a new timetable that, you know, they're not going to do anything until we sign a contract. So this timetable has had real dates like May 1st, May 15th, you do this, and who's, whose job it is to commit to that task? Is it the search committee? Is it League of Cities and Towns? You know, who's doing what, when, that it has specific dates so you could tell pretty much whether you were on track or you were behind and whether or not there was uh, room to keep up. So that's something we would want them to commit to doing after we've signed the uh, contract. Um, and just one note on that, Skip, I'm just ballparking here. So it, this is a 16-week timetable, so that's four months. Um, so yeah, I just wanted, in terms of timing, that's the other piece, I think, just for all of us and wanting to have that buffer in there is going to be sooner. But again, this is the first time seeing this, but just yeah. stating for the record, of assuming we could start in May, I mean, that's going to be into, what, October following the 16-week timeline, which we think is aggressive, so like, <laughs> Um, They're estimating they'll be done by the end of August if we get this in uh, Four months. Four months. Yes. Yeah, depending on. Four months from go, whatever go. <laughs> and that we talked about the so last select board. We ideally wanted to have the next person on board to spend some time with Bill to you know glean some stuff off from him. And mm -hmm. it's really good. I know. When I, I left my position as program director, I spent a month with my successor, which was the first time it was ever done, and he was really thankful. Mm -hmm. Because he was coming from Michigan, so. 
we learned about Vermont and New Hampshire. Right. So you know, and that, depending on who you hire, how long they want to come, too. Exactly. You know, there's, there's a lot at play here. Another one was, uh, you know, these direct costs. Are they costs that um, the LTC pays and it's covered under ours, or are there these part of the costs that we pay and uh, they're outside the contract rate? It, it wasn't clear here, um, you know, like the candidate, candidate travel expenses, are they going to pay for them and then we, they're covered under the contract or, you know, I think all of there's that. questions as to, you know, what was the 12,500 covering it? Um, well, that kind covers everything, but again, their cost, you know, you look at the consultant, their costs are going to be running, you know, five to $7,250. And then there are all those additional costs, which I think we're going to be paying for. Upon okay, the it, it did, it isn't clear that that's yeah. what it was. And we also had a question, you know, if um, how long do those costs hold if, you know, it, when it, it was an extra month, are those costs still good and, and things that people uh, had a question on? Um, An agreement will outline terms and or not to exceed contract amount. Yeah, right. Is what it says at the bottom of the page. Right. They have, you know, 50 to 75 hours and additional work will be billed at $90 per hour. Yeah. So, um, page seven, um, you know, the job description we talked about, um, you know, all these duties, and there's really two jobs here. There's the select board job and there's the input job. Um, so it's really, you know, you're coming up with two job descriptions there. Um, you know, and the salary range. Um, there's, you know, two. Well, would we want to combine the job description as one? Because well, I don't know. I no, I don't think we had agreed to that. I understand. We're kind of heading that direction, and maybe. Well, I. I think you need to do two. Okay. And two job descriptions for one person. Yeah. Well, yes, but. You know, EFUD could hire somebody else if we don't like this. That's being the double municipality here. And even when we get to the end, we talk about, uh, I think we should have a contract with this new manager, too, that we don't have to build. That I think the way of the world is today, they would probably want a contract. If we want a, would want a contract that what are the performance things? Is there a probation period? Um, you know, if you're going to get terminated, they probably want to know something. And I think you need two contracts. So if EFA decides we're not happy, we're going to get rid of them, then, you know, the select board may not agree. And now you're under their contract, not ours. Totally understand. You know, I think so that's I think a reasonable request, especially because we're not merged yet. Um, to coordinate that right. the process and what we VLCT could help support yes. it because there's yes. nothing more fun than wonky jobs to apply for. Oh, the funding is guaranteed for one year. If, but anyway, I think no, VLCT really. will be a great partner in sorting out. Yeah. Scope and mentioned there, you know, the uh, contract for the Montpelier manager was just in the paper recently as to what they're doing. And having a contract these days is more likely than you know, not. Hopefully, League of Cities and Towns can help us with that because I, you know, we have no experience there. Um, another one was this position profile that I'm, you know, that was a, that was one of the things that was supposed to be attached. Um, that was it that they would prepare. Um, you know, we mentioned the, uh, some education on this confidentiality part of the process. Um, 
you know, the screening and evaluating the applicants. We're glad to have that. Um, steps four and five. Schedule the interviews, the interview questions, conduct interviews, and debrief. I think they had two weeks to do that. Um, you know, um, and then like the last one we had, we mentioned is having a contract and things that, you know, we're going to have to hire an attorney to help us with a contract and things. Um, you know, it ought to be something. I don't think we wait till we have, you know, selected the candidate that, because that will prolong the process if you're going to trying to develop the contract at the same time. We know the things we would like to have in the contract. So if we've kind of prepared ours while we're doing the search, once you've made your selection, you can show them, here's what you know, our suggested contract is there things you would want in there and whether those were acceptable, you've kind of cut down some time. Um, well, maybe I'm wrong to skip, but Vermont League of Seas and Towns has a whole cadre of attorneys. Some of them are very special. Some of them I know from our training were very specialized in human resource law. She's on here, I think. Abby Friedman, I assume she's she, she, she's on the yeah, that's who we were in the proposal, right? In, in here, mm -hmm. but there were specific attorneys yeah. that dealt with human resources, and I would just assume, see, yes, they're gonna as part of their contract with us, they're gonna look at that. You know, they're the human resource experts, and I'm not saying we don't want to just say sign right off. But then our town attorney could take a look at that. Well, who, who are you using for a town attorney? I mean, he he needs to be involved. I don't think the LTC is going to prepare a contract. No, no, they're not, they're not going to look at the contract. But I think they're looking at, they're going to have some help in terms of human resource law and stuff like that. that they're yeah, providing. and I expect our attorney would be talking to them. But we need to take the initiative that our attorney is looking at it. Mm -hmm. And we want them to prepare it prior to, oh, well, you, we're going to start on September 1st, but we want a contract. And, well, you know, now it's three weeks to prepare a contract before he wants to start. And, yeah, so we'll work on that in mm -hmm. parallel with everything yeah. else that's going on and not wait right. till the end. Yes. Right. Has ZFUD uh, engaged a, a lawyer, uh, an attorney for this? Pardon? Does EBUD have an attorney that's going to be working on this? No. Um, we used Joe McLean on some things. I talked to Bill. Who was the other uh, personnel attorney you mentioned? Yeah. Scott Cameron had done some work for us. So that needs to be a discussion, you know, among us. Who, who is our recommended attorney right. to, to work on this for us? So. Um, would there be any conflict of having the same attorney work for both of us? I'm not sure you would need two, two contracts. I understand what Skip is saying, but I, you know, I think the thing you do quickest is to appoint your representatives and get right. this meeting with the LCT. Mm -hmm. But you know, they, I don't have a contract, uh, and I've never had a contract. Um, here, and um, I think it's more than norm now. There are other communities out there that have, you know, Ludlow still has a town and a village, I believe, and I think the same person is the manager there. Um, it can, you, you can work it out, I'm sure, um, but the two boards have to be kind of on the same page because, as Skip said a minute ago, and I used to say this jokingly all the time. This process is a little bit easier because back when I applied, there were three elected boards that had to deal with this. There was a village trustees and elected water commissioners that right. all appointed right. me. 
But, um, you know, I, I would, when we'd go around the room and for the priorities that you just did, we have a joint meeting and say, okay, the select board, they have those five priorities and the trustees have these five priorities and the water commissioners have those three priorities. So I have three number one priorities. Who decides which number one is which number number one? So you're going to have to figure out a way to, to work it out. Right. But I think Skip's right. You need to get going and get, right. you know, point some... And I think from my conversation out. with Skip is that the commissioners are meeting and they're going to appoint two people. I know in the past, from the previous board, and I'll leave this open, the initial representatives were going to be myself and Dan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if either of you two have any strong feelings for or against or would you like, you know, I think we should wait in terms of the public participation, if we want a public representative, to let the VLCT say what our, our pros and cons. But what's your your guys' feeling? Um, more power to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, and personally, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to have you two with more represent, uh, more experience uh, uh, on the board to, to represent us as delegates. Uh, and uh, I think I'd appreciate being informed uh, uh, as to what's going forward, and uh, I'd like to have a say in the, in the final selection uh, at some point. As much as we can, speaking to Skip's issue of confidentiality or something. Right, but well, I think the confidentiality, like they, they spell it out in there right. when it choose to go forward, they put numbers instead of names on the thing. So we can right. discuss the applicants, we don't use their names, we right. just use number six mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So, so they'll, they'll help direct us. Yeah. Ultimately, it's going to have to be the vote of the board. Yeah. The, the search right. committee yeah. can't yeah. hire right. a, a manager. Right. So, so I'm fine with it. Have to go back to the board for a final. I'm just, uh, I mean, I don't want to be sick in the mud. I think it's like, a, I, I think it needs to move forward and needs to move forward. What's our next step? So it sounds like the next step is approving this thing to VLCT. I will say explicitly at the last meeting, it was that. Danny and Mike, we're going to have an initial meeting. And right. I just so we we well, stopped yeah. tonight, so, so I'm just yeah. trying to, I thought we were yeah. going to have a broader conversation. I assumed the two people, it was because of quorum issues. Is it the possibility that both boards could be the hiring committee? I'm not trying to, yeah. I just, it I don't was, feel it was about asked making to all not have those. that meeting so that e could have ample time to right. look at this. Okay, so then for an initial meeting, I think, okay, so, but just to clarify, because that was my, I think we already made that motion at the last We did, we just were asked. So if you want to reaffirm it, Thanks, Danny and Mike having a meeting about something. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think we kind of was. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that you were no, doing the first I, meeting. I, I appreciate said, that. Um, I said, but I'm just trying more. to understand. It's just this question of the whole. You can't include all. Um, we, we and just wanted to read what they were trying. Did they make a motion? Yeah, I think I don't know if they made one we before. We did last. I think we did last. I think we did last. Uh, I just wanted. Hold on a minute. Make sure with the more discussion that that was the we're, we're, we're good with that. Municipal manager search. And we're going to explain there's been a number of discussions with VLCT to engage their services. The boards will have to decide whether there should be a resident member on the committee. The right. recruitment process was discussed. Uh, w. Shuffler recommended conflict in VLCT. Um, there was no name. Danny said she will forward the VLCT contract to the boards and set up a meeting. Each, one board. each board will designate two people to attend the initial meeting. Roger Clapp made a motion to move forward with VLCT okay. and engage the commissioners, second by CBS and pass on behalf of EFA. Yeah, but you didn't make a motion. You didn't pick no, you didn't point people. Yeah, you're right. That's why. Right. You didn't you pick make a people. motion to choose will, Mike and Danny. So. Yep. All right. I, I move that uh, Mike and Danny represent uh, the select board on this uh, uh, manager search. Second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. So, Skip, you're going to, if the sooner you could get to us with your two representatives. Yeah. Um, Maybe Thursday. What my suggestion from this point with that schedule I gave you was to, uh, I don't know if you folks have any comments other than what's on here. Um, 
Thirty seconds. Right. <laughs> 30 seconds. No, I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm That's on me. I sent it to only Eva, and I didn't send it to you, so I'm sorry. The only, the only real other things I had partial concern with some of the things that you already addressed. I'm not going to go re-go over those. Okay. But the thing that I had maybe a, I'm a little concerned, and maybe that's going to come out with discussion with VLCT, how we're going to go with. An initial search, which would probably be, as they said, by phone, email, et cetera, but then how many people we want to bring in for interviews. And mm -hmm. I know they talked about one to two or... Is that part of the contract, though? Well, that's part of their, what was their outline of what they're doing. It would be part of their contract. Well, I'll, yeah, but I don't see us... We can decide now how many people we want to see till you see the application. Well, you, I always say, I hate to look at very narrowly, we only have a couple of candidates. And I know you don't want to prolong the search, but it's always good to have a few more, few candidates so you have a variety you know, of as many candidates as you can get. I mean, oh, I know. Initially, you're going to do that, and they're going to wheel, wheel it down, but I think in terms of maybe like the final interviews, to me, maybe interviewing just one or two people may not, personally, may not be enough. The top of page 10 says the goal of this step is to take a large group of candidates, normally right. five to ten, and right. through interviews, reduce the number to two to three finalists. Sounds like a good process to me. Yeah. So these are the EFUD comments that came from all of us. Um, and my goal was, if we can, to have a revised contract for your meeting on the 18th as to whether or not we can sign it or not. At least we could talk about it if it's a joint meeting. I would like to send these comments to Abigail, tell them these are, if they're not the select board's comment, at least the refund, to look at right. the contract, how would it be modified to address these? The select, we'll choose our two people on Thursday night, uh, Thursday afternoon there, um, so that we will, they will have had these to look at them, then the select committee can decide whether we're going to do a Zoom meeting, we're going to go up there. After they've had a chance to look at the comments and what can they do with the goal of having a revised contract ready for your meeting on the 18th. Right. But I think between now and then, we, the, at least the four representatives should meet with that. Right, so the conversation was, was to have whether it's an in-person or a hybrid meeting, to have an actual sit-down to ask these questions yes. in person, well, then we'll have a contract that everyone will... But I think it's better to send them ahead of time so okay. they know the questions, sure. and by the time they meet, sure. they can say, well, this is no problem. Oh, yes, we, we sure. can do this. That you're saving time. Totally understand. Sure. So what we need though, and what we talked about last time, so realizing, I'm sorry, I dropped the ball and sending it to you, but what I'll do is keep you apprised of a meeting date so that we can get your input and questions before that, so I'll keep you up to date. Mm -hmm. But what we what we do want to do is, we talked about asking them for a meeting, asking Abby and, um, what's his name, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank, Rick, Rick. Um, for the meeting, so knowing who you want to be in attendance so that we can give them options for a calendar days and time. Yeah, we'll know that on Thursday. Okay, so I will That'd not be, be so I will, I'll reach, so, okay, great. What I, but I would like to send these comments to them tomorrow, not to wait till Thursday. Sure, so what I'll do is let them know that we'd like to have a meeting, send some, send these questions in advance, knowing not some will be coming before the meeting, and then let them know that on Thursday we'll have, be able to offer some days and times. Yeah. After Thursday, sorry. Well, it's likely to be myself and Natalie, Cindy works, Bob's going to have a summer job inspecting dams, and Lefty doesn't have email and stuff on a job. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Um, just, just a technical question for Bill. Uh, if we meet this committee, 
I know it's two from the select board and two from EFUD. I assume we're exempt from yeah, public. It's not a meeting. Yeah. Okay, it's not a because if we had a third person, it wouldn't That's be right. a meeting. That's <laughs> right. Two and two. Just making sure. Because I'm saying we have two and two. And they're separate. Yeah, they're separate boards. Parts. And uh, should Alyssa and I send our questions to Danny? Yeah, that's that probably that'd be good. That way it comes through Thank one you. source. Mm -hmm. I agree. I was going to say, with, with, to respect our use of DLCT's time, and I yeah. refer to the four of you, but maybe you. one point of contact would be good. So yeah, right. right. yeah. answering to one person. Okay. So we're okay with me sending these, and I'll copy you on the email and things. Well, do you want me to send them since I'm going to ask send about them the meeting? They're okay. e-fund. Okay. So I'd rather send them at this point. Okay. And if you've got some in addition to that. So what I would say is like some of them I can talk to you after. And just some because they're they comments, have. it doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna do it. They may have some other options when we get there to talk about it too. Right. Um, these are just the comments to get things yeah. started. Um, you know, this is, we've had this thing for better than two months, and this is the first contact of getting back to them, so. Well, the biggest problem has been the change of the board and stuff like that. That has kind of hampered, you know, we, we all but said we're not going to do anything until we have a new board. Yep. So, um, we got it. We're, so, we're, we're moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kip. We'll get you, we'll get you back to the basketball game. Okay. And I thank you for no surprises tonight, as you did last time, although it was a good surprise. Uh, oh, you can only take so many, right? Only so many surprises. Oh, and Chris, come back to he isn't this. here tonight, but he did a good job there. I was pleased he mentioned my dog. There's a lot of things that are worth saying, uh, being mentioned with your dog. And uh, I've had a lot of comments and things from people since it got in the newspaper. So, And it is. It's a pleasure to be uh, in the same category as a two-time winner of the board. <laughs> <laughs> the only two-time winner in uh, Phil's gonna go history. For a history. Right? In history. Oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> so Another thank you when I go home Jim. and uh, watch the game and uh, we'll catch up later. That and was thank you, Dave. That was also I'm going to be reading the arts. So I'm so prepared. Okay. okay, let's move on to manager's oh, items. We're a little behind. Uh, Bill, discussion of uh, ARPA administration and compliance. All right, Nick needs to come up here. So you, oh, you're on. Uh, okay. So, uh, thank you, doctor, for coming up. I heard both from uh, Mike and, and Alyssa last week. They went to uh, training at the LCT and, and not surprisingly there was some conversation there about APRA and um, we have a reporting requirement coming up as of April 30th. We have to report uh, what we've done as of March 31st and the reporting deadline is April uh, 30th of, of this year. So the reporting period is from when ARPA was approved last March, March 3rd, 2021, through March 31st, 2022. We didn't get any money until the fall of 2021, uh, and the money has been sitting in our bank. And while we have made some decisions about how we're going to use our money, uh, nothing has been spent uh, as of now. Um, we have, uh, I think all of you understand that when we have town meeting, there's a 30-day period in which we have to wait until uh, folks have the chance to appeal any decision made at town meeting and ask for a uh, uh, revote, if you will. So the 30 days just ended um, April 1st, which is past March 31st. So our report is going to be basically, we haven't spent any money. Uh, we will have this issue on the agenda for the next meeting um, as well because as both Mike and Alyssa heard, uh, 
in the intervening time between when we received the money and we learned all kinds of information about how we had to um, identify lost revenue, uh, because if you could identify lost revenue, you were much, it was much easier to spend the money, uh, basically you transfer it from the ARPA fund into your general fund and then appropriate it. Um, but you could only, the, the, the rules were that you could only appropriate your ARPA money up to the amount of lost revenue that you could determine. And uh, VLCT, along with Memric, who does our accounting software, worked together collaboratively and built a lost revenue calculator. And in 2021, after we received the money, I worked with Michelle Ryan, our bookkeeper, and we put our 2020 revenues into the calculator. And determined that in that particular year we had, uh, I think the number was somewhere in like $350,000 range of lost revenue. And I anticipated that we would have the same amount of lost revenue or thereabouts between 21, uh, you know, in 21. When I went to tell Michelle to put the 21 revenues into the lost revenue calculator. I had missed the, missed the directive, if you will. Uh, the people at Memory told, uh, told Michelle, she said, well, you don't have to use the lost revenue calculator any longer because Congress has, well, the Treasury Department has passed a rule, and the rule is that uh, all monies up to $10 million that any municipality receives, if you're a municipality like Waterbury as opposed to a municipality like Burlington, and Burlington is the only one in the state that doesn't fit into the broadest category that we're in. So what the rule says now is all ARPA funds that you receive as a municipality can be used has lost revenue up to $10 million. And our share is going to be about 1.5 million, so that's way less than 10 million. So at the next meeting, we'll probably have an agenda item, and I will ask you to formally make a motion to uh, stipulate that we are going to apply ARPA money uh, uh, and use it all as lost revenue, which simply means that we can use our normal budgeting process in order to make appropriations. Now we did that with the money, uh, some of the money uh, that we appropriated at town meeting. The $100,000 that we appropriated to the ICE Center, um, I had uh, plugged that in and that was going to be lost revenue. The $600,000 that we have put in the budget and appropriated to EFUD, that is an eligible uh, expenditure, so I wasn't going to call that lost revenue. But I talked with Katie Buckley, the VLCT um, uh, ARPA czar, if you will. Um, <laughs> he is. I, I spoke with her last week and said, it seems to me that we would be in the best position if we put everything in the lost revenue column uh, and even the $600,000, which is an eligible expenditure, uh, there's much less onerous reporting requirements. So we will make everything lost revenue, and going forward, we'll simply use our budget process to, to appropriate the money. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have public information meetings, that you can't engage the public to say, okay, you know, we still have whatever it is, $900,000 of ARPA funds left that's unappropriated. How would we like to use them? Um, if, as it was pointed out at the last meeting, and I have confirmed this, the select board is the final arbiter of how money can be used. So the select board, even in Vermont, and that's what my question was, because in Vermont, um, if you're a town, like Waterbury is, under the general laws of the state, the select board uh, 
recommends a budget to the voters, and the, the voters are the legislative body that actually appropriates the money. So I didn't know if in Vermont that process had to be followed. And uh, the advice that we've been getting from Katie, luckily, is no. Uh, the federal government made the rules for this, and the legislative body of the community is the select board. So the select board is within its rights, even you know at the next meeting, if you want to appropriate $75,000 to CD5, or you're within your rights to do that. But we'll, we'll consider everything lost revenue, which will give us the, the biggest flexibility and the least onerous reporting requirement. We are still required to um, appropriate all the money by the end of 2024. So we've still got uh, almost you know, two full years to, to do anything that way. And it has to be spent by 2026. So those provisions still stick. Is it yeah. only the um, timeline provisions, or are there still other compliance provisions? The, the compliance, there, there, there will still be reporting. There's annual reporting. But because it's we're going to classify the all as lost right. revenue. The allocation the, restrictions. It's simply going to be yeah. we, we, Put it back we in. spent this money, That's great. Uh, so it, it should be fairly straightforward. Assuming that you can keep up with the constant barrage <laughs> of, of uh, you know emails that we get from the U.S. Department of Treasury that I uh, I forward along to I forward along to to Nick. So um, is that calendar uh, 2024? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Calendar 24 and calendar 26, as far as right. spending is concerned. So, um, what I'd like to do, uh, and you might decide to wait until the 18th to do this if you want to think about it a little bit, but back in um, July of last year, on the 9th, um, I went into the U.S. Department of Treasury's portal and filled out the information that was required. And last year, sometime before uh, July 9th, the select board appointed me as the authorized representative uh, for the town of Water with regard to ARPA. And you appointed Carla, uh, the town treasurer, as the secondary contact. And I think I would like either today or at the next meeting, if you want to think about it and talk about it, because it's getting a little bit late now. Um, I would like to have, and I've already talked about this with Carl, I don't think you'll be offended if you're taken off of the proper contact list. I would be deeply grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, he forwards to Nick and I hit delete. <laughs> totally. So I think, I think what I would like to do... I feel your pain. What I would like to do even now is to make Nick the authorized representative and make me the secondary contact. Now, he didn't know I was going to say that until tonight. <laughs> uh, I think we've been talking about getting Nick on here as a secondary contact. Um, I have two reasons that I would like to appoint Nick as the authorized representative and me to be the secondary contact. One. Uh, and this is the biggest thing for me, is he's way better with electronic communication and negotiating <laughs> portals and all the rest of that stuff than I am. Uh, and, uh, you know, he has been following some of these things. Uh, but I think it makes sense. Um, I'm going to be transitioning away from here at the end of the year. Um, when I do leave, then at that point, maybe the board changes and whoever the new town manager is uh, becomes the authorized representative. But for now, for me, it just would make me feel better if Nick was the authorized representative. And he, I'm putting him on the spot a little bit. If you don't want to do that, you can <laughs> say, no, I'll be the secondary contact and I'll live with you. But yeah. A few weeks ago, you already told me you were going to be the oh, secondary. Oh, I did? Yeah, okay. that's not me. I didn't think I said anything to you. Of course, I'm, I've been finding out a lot lately that I forget a lot. Of things. And you cited the technology piece as well. Yeah, <laughs> that's absolutely the case. 
Um, so I'd like to, I'd like you to do, to do that. I think it will serve uh, the community much better with that. Um, and uh, so, do you have questions? We, we have a motion, and then we can bring it here. Yeah, I'll move that uh, Nick become the authorized representative for the ARPA funding, and that Bill become the secondary uh, representative. Thank you, Roger. Do you have a second? Second. Second. A discussion. Um, yeah, what, what are the, aside from, you know, actually just logging in and using the, <laughs> the computer pieces, what, what does that entail, really? What does that mean? He's, the authorized representative is the one that makes communication with the Department mm -hmm. of Treasury. And what it's going to mean now is that before April 30th, Nick will ensure that it's reporting that that has to be done, is done uh, properly and in a timely basis. Uh, you know, if Nick gets uh, hit by the rec bus, then I will step up and do the job. Is um, it just annually, the reporting then? What's that? Is it just annual reporting for the funding? For the funding? Um, right. right now, that's what I am aware of, but there is, as I said, there's a continual... Oh, the communications are all, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, been that's how the power funds work. Yeah, or and, and uh, you know whatever the whatever the reporting requirements end up being, it will be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know they, we're already on the, the portal, but in, I think it's this email they sent out saying, or maybe it was one last week that you know that uh, they're not using. Um, the Dunn's number anymore. Oh, yeah. and we're no, Sam, you are you being identified? Sam, yeah. 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 No, I think it makes all too, especially with Bill's transition, I think having Nick, it's just such a smart thing to do. You know, whoever the new town man, you know, they may have another thought, so we can just revisit it when that happens. And I think it's also something with the whole discussion I think we're having next of, you know, him becoming, what is it, the community service officer? Yeah, we, we can. We can transition to that. So did you vote? Uh, no, 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 no. That, but that was just my thought is yeah. with that is some, that's something within the, that, that valley. But, but if no one has any questions, we can bring it to a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Okay, so now we want to bring up the... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, congratulations. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. On your new power. You're new power. It's this one. I don't need that. I was saying, yeah, and I would just say the reason I called Bill is because Katie Buckley was quite emphatic in her presentation that if you're taking revenue loss, it has to be this reporting period. It must be done now. That's it cannot go back. So that's, that's just to say, that's why I at least gave Bill a call. Yeah, that, and that's oh, right. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, I, I believe me, I have no, uh, no qualms when people call me up and say, do you know that you have to do X, Y, Z? That's not, not a problem. And now that you've appointed Nick, I'm confident that he's <laughs> properly. Okay. We can okay. move on to next. Uh, if we want to move on to update on wage and salary ranges, like I said, uncomfortable. Should we want to at first just discuss the Nick's part of it? Um, we no. Have up here? No, he can stay here. This <laughs> one, I think. Um, so you all got the memo that I yep. sent yep. to you. I apologize um, that it was Sunday afternoon before I got it to you. Um, I, I just got tied up last week. As an aside, um, I'm generally working now Sundays to Thursdays. My, I'm taking my weekend as Fridays and Saturdays for the most part. Um, you know, I work every day in some respects, and that's always the way it's been. And you know, I will. 
always do what needs to be done to get the job done. I think you all know that already about me. But I am, um, you know, beginning, even though we've only been in this building for five years, I have, you know, 34 years worth of stuff that you have to kind of get through and decide what needs to be kept. And I've been trying over the past, well, really since we got here, to, to do a lot more filing uh, electronically than, than I had in the past. And I'm also trying to put uh, a good template in place where, you know, the, whoever the next person is understands that, okay, it's January and this needs to be done in addition to, you know, a meeting every Monday night and a meeting most Wednesday afternoons. Um, and when it comes to, you know, February, this needs to be done and you need to do this memo and you've got to do the, the, um, uh, the bond compliance with the bond bank before, you know, March 1st. And so in order to do all of the things I need to do to try to make the transition smooth, it's a lot easier to do a lot of that on a Sunday when there's nobody else in the building uh, and the phone isn't ringing. So for those of you who are listening out there, don't call me on some of this. Um, but anyway, so if you find that I'm not here often enough on a Friday for your liking, you'll know that I've been here on Sunday. But if there's anything that I, I need to do, of course I will. And if the public can only meet with me on a Friday, I'll certainly accom accommodate those kind of uh, requests. Anyway, um, Pay raises typically take place in April. Uh, as I just said, uh, we've got the 30-day appeal period after town meeting day. So we get into April and um, we, we, now we have a good budget. And for 2022, um, I budgeted basically the first 14 weeks of the year at the, at the old pay rates for employees and then uh, the, the next 38 weeks of the year will be a new pay. So pay raises will go into effect the middle of this month. And um, I wrote this memo, which is similar to the one that I wrote last year with some emphasis placed on what's been happening with inflation. And you all know that from just looking at the news. And I, I didn't go to look at the latest CPI numbers, but you know they're they're the eight percent range right now. Um, you know, back at the beginning of the year when when we were putting the budget together, things were still in the two to three percent range, and then you know it really started to ratchet up with the first the gas prices and the continuous supply chain issues, and then of course the war in Ukraine has made it even worse. Um, and we can't fix all of that all at once. Uh, last year, for Alyssa and Roger's benefit, uh, I did go to the board on a couple of occasions and say, you know, we've got to make some new year adjustments. And even though they weren't really in the budget, because uh, we we're frankly put under a lot of pressure, uh, especially in the public works departments, where uh, surrounding communities were offering starting pay that was higher than we were paying people that had worked here for 10 years doing the same job. And, you know, it's, it's not like they had to drive to Bennington to get that job. You know, it was within a reasonable community period. So uh, we did give some raises uh, in November to the, to the highway department. Uh, on the EFUD side of things, I had done some things a little bit earlier with the water and sewer employees. And then in December, I came to the select board and I said, for the administrative staff, I would like to, to give them a small bump uh, in December, which would simply raise their base before we got into the new year and then calculate on that. So um, the ranges, uh, and if you saw those uh, colors that I gave you, um, most of the ranges didn't change too much. Last year was the first year in, in probably five or six that I even had to come in and change the ranges. We were all, all, you know, we were able to keep within that range 
that we had set a number of years ago because for the last several years before 20, mid 2021, you know, inflation was almost non-existent. It was in a 2% range. So the ranges didn't have to get adjusted very much at all. But we did adjust them a little bit last year, and I've made some adjustments here this year. Um, as I said, uh, the budget was built, and uh, you know, the, uh, we don't, um, the select board does not, has not typically set the individual wage rates for individuals. The manager has been given that uh, authority to do that. Um, uh, none of what I've written here is uh, anything that we didn't budget for. So everything that's on the page was included in the 2022 budget. So there's no surprises there. Um, so you haven't changed any of these based on the new inflation rate? Um, no, not for, for now, I haven't. Um, the, what, what I tried to say, Roger, was we made some changes last year. Right, I got that. Uh, we gave raises in April, and we made a couple of mid-year adjustments right. to get them up here. And then, you know, you can see what I, I did say here in that third paragraph, uh, you know, th this budget, there is a wide-ranging pay increase depending on uh, if you go employee by employee, some as little as 3%, those are the ones that got significant bump ups last year to kind of adjust them to the market. So a 3% raise, you know, if I was doing the budget all over again, maybe it would be a 5%, but I've got 3% and that's what we're, we budgeted and that's what I'll do. Um, doesn't mean that I, depending on where things continue to go with inflation. You know, I could come back to the board again in September and say, you know, we're going to have to, to do something. We're, we're in a strange place because for a long time, um, I won't say it was an employer's market, but we, did, we didn't have that pressure on us uh, of the, uh, uh, the increasing wage rates right now. And as you know, all of you know that you know, there's lots of help wanted signs out there, and there's lots of jobs people don't want to do. Um, you know, the service industry jobs, uh, getting people to work in restaurants and things like that, warehouses, um, people don't want those kinds of jobs, and they're in a position that they feel that they don't have to take them. And, you know, we've got a lot of people with pretty good skills that are, are marketable. Not in only in other municipalities, but in other uh, private industries as well. So I'll, I'll try to stay on top of it. I haven't been hearing any real grumblings right now. We'll see what happens. So. Any questions about that? Okay. So we were kind of discussed last year, so. What? We have discussed it last year. Yeah, but they were on the I, I understand, but. It, it was, at this point, even though I think what Roger's question was leading to with the most recent kind of inflation, I don't think we're in, in a position to change, radically change the structure because we have a budget kind of in place for the year. Right. I mean, it is sort of an extraordinary situation oh, that was not predicted uh, four months ago. Right. And, and I think what we're going to have to do is to be nimble, flexible, whatever word you want to call it, uh, and just keep our eyes and ears open. And, and you know, we'll, I will be um, very communicative with the board as I was last year if I face these kind of difficulties. And, you know, of course, the later in the year that you make adjustments, the less impact it has on the current budget year that we're in. So, and you know we've done that in the past too. We we did it last year. Is make some adjustments at the end of a calendar year that won't really impact the budget, but gets them to a, a new base, and then the next budget you can go up. Exceeding budget. It almost may be more of a question for next budget season. How how to deal with it? So we don't need any more of this. No. Um, I would I would ask you to make a motion to approve the pay ranges that are here because the yellow is new from, uh, from last gotcha. year. So. 
Do we, we have a motion? So moved. Thank you. I'll second it. We have a motion, second. Any further discussion? So, Bill, you're not, you don't have any other concerns? I guess that was my question. You answered it to some extent, but you don't have any concerns about retention and giving. I, I have, I have, cons I don't have any known concerns. Mm -hmm. right? I, I don't know that there's trouble growing, let's put it that way. Um, you know, I'm hopeful, I, as we all are, you know, you, the Federal Reserve is picking up interest rates. So I'm glad I'm not a young person looking to try to get a mortgage, but, um, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a way that you try to rein in inflation. Um, you know, we've been hearing that there's a lot of the inflation is kind of a temporary phenomenon based on all the stimulus money and it's going to start to ratchet down. And then, of course, the Russians threw Ukraine into the mix a couple of months ago now, which is really a, a wild card and, and we'll see. So we'll, we'll pay attention to it and if I s hear that there's trouble, I'll, I'll obviously talk to the board about it. Um, but I think for right now, I've been, I believe, transparent with the staff. They, they, I think they know what to expect in terms of raises and go from there. Any further questions? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. So with regard to Nick, um, Mike, you talked yep. about that. So I jumped ahead a little. Uh, that's okay. Uh, and I explained here that Nick's uh, going to move from uh, from a non-exempt position, which means he gets paid overtime, to an exempt position. He'll be uh, supervising more people more regularly. Um, Nick and I are in the process, by the way, of getting ready to get. Um, a uh, advertisement out for the new full-time recreation person that's been budgeted for. Uh, we didn't quite get it done on the next select board meeting. We'll, we'll bring the job description to get you to approve the job description for the new employee. But I think we're gonna advertise for it before the job description is formally adopted by the select board because uh, we were hoping to have that person start in May sometime, right? So that's just around the corner. Uh, and we'd like to get uh, that person uh, hired as soon as, as soon as we can. Um, Nick has been uh, actively working with me, trying to, uh, you know, as you all know, I think Nick just received his doctorate degree. Uh, he's very interested in administration and and learning uh, the ins and outs of municipal government. Uh, I think he's decided he wants to make municipal government his career, at least for as far down the road as somebody his age can see. Uh, but he's made a commitment there. And uh, we're meeting on a weekly basis right now, uh, um, helping him understand uh, a lot of um, the issues with regard to finance, uh, borrowing, uh, working with the auditors, which is always a joy. Um, yeah, and uh, the, the, just the various things that have to be done on a budgetary basis. And I think my hope here is that uh, with, by imparting this information to him, notice I didn't say wisdom, <laughs> uh, by imparting this information to him, you know, somebody else will be able to help in the, in the transition uh, as I move out. And frankly, we're trying to figure out what, um, what title uh, I should provide him. Uh, the Director of Recreation and Community Services is what I put on your, uh, the memo that I sent to you. And that's to recognize just what we've budgeted for in this new budget. So he's going to have a, another full-time recreation employee. He already uh, manages and supervises the uh, 
all the seasonal recreation staff does a good job at it. Thank goodness I don't have to deal with all of those. Uh, how many of them are there now? 50? Yeah. 60? Yeah. Just, I find, I cramp my arm signing the time cards every week when summer comes. So. Uh, anyway, um, and, and then we're, the budget also contemplates a community service officer that uh, we budgeted to come on in July. So Nick will be working with me on that to come up with the job description. And my plan was that Nick was going to supervise that person as well, be the direct supervisor, so that position will be a direct report to this director of recreation and community services. Um, we talked about the APRA administration already. Um, you know, we can have a title that's that long. Uh, I'm, I'm still thinking about what we might propose. So if you want to think about it yourselves, you can. If you want to talk to me or even think about it, you can do that as well. But we'll, we'll revisit that. But I just want to make sure that nobody has an issue with it, uh, that you think that it's a reasonable thing to do. And uh, I think you know we've got a, a good employee here and, and somebody that uh, is interested in taking leadership positions. And, and roles, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm still disappointed in the select board, and, and you know, not not the current people because <laughs> none, of you, people, none of you are none of you are none of you are here. Uh, Chris Viennes was here at the time, but you know, when when uh, when Leanne Viennes uh, retired as our bookkeeper, I recommended to the board then that. We should hire, if not an assistant manager, at least a finance director. And uh, and the pushback was, well, that's another position, and it's more tax money, and you're doing a great job at it. Just keep doing it. And it's like, okay, wanted to try to build some transition because I knew at some point there's going to be a whole bunch of people leaving this organization. Uh, and. And you know, I thought about it again a couple of years ago, and then the pandemic hit, and that just kind of threw everything into a turmoil. Uh, we were laying off people. We, we you know, we, we were cutting staff and trying to cut um, expenditures to because we didn't know what was going to be happening with revenue. So I never really revisited the the uh, that. Opportunity wouldn't have been a good look at that point in time. Yeah, but uh, we're in a different place in time now, and you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I can't tell you how many months and days and weeks and minutes it is until I retire. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> that anxious to retire because <laughs> I still like this job. But I, I guess I'm trying to just let you know that you need to think. Not only about replacing me, but just having some um, uh, a stable of good people here mm -hmm. that hopefully will stay around. I agree. So. I think it's a. I think it's a. They need it's something. When I first got more involved the town a few years ago, I was shocked that the what you did. <laughs> like you know, the curse of being good at your job is then you have to do more and then uh, not have you know more. So I think having more staff, having people who are here with institutional knowledge, um, having good leadership and management, I mean, we're a growing town. So if we ignore that, we're gonna be in big, big trouble, especially with losing you. So um, yeah, I think it's really important to have, have, have some foresight, um, just like we talk about keeping people here with competitive salaries because they're highly skilled. Um, it goes hand in hand with that, in my opinion. I agree with Danny. I saw that firsthand in USDA, where we were an aging agency. You know, we were a very capable agency, but we had a lot of people closing in on retirement. And I said, "You got to, we got to, you know, look at training and giving people training opportunities to get into leadership roles, and it's really important as that kind of." And I think we're going to see that we're seeing this right now in our town. We're seeing kind of see a brain drain 
kind of leaving our town with, you know, Bill and Steve. Mm -hmm. Steve headed up? Yeah. You know, there would be a few others that are going to be, you know, probably not that far behind them. But it's something that you have to look at, you have to plan, you have to give people opportunity, you have to enrich what their experience is. And some, some people don't want to leave. You know, that's, I hate to say that, you know, leadership is, can be, can be tough, you know, the buck stops here sometimes, but. So anyway, if you just think yeah. about it for the. Yeah. I think it's something we're going to be definitely yeah. thinking. Uh, as I said, you know, feel free to have a conversation with me, even with Nick, I'm, I'm not opposed. You said before you wanted to meet with the highway department, I have mixed feelings about board members dealing, you know, with, uh, with, uh, it's one thing, anyway, right. I'm not opposed to it, we can talk about that, but I'm letting you know that I'm okay if you have discussions with you. Yeah. We're not, do, I wouldn't do anything to excerpt your, I understand. you know what I'm going, it's just like, you kind of want to hear from these people, and sometimes they feel like, they, they feel like the select board's just out there, and sometimes they, hey, the select board may actually care about it, and that, that's, that's one thing, it's not about what your job is, it's what we may be able to offer them. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say there, right now. So there's no action necessary tonight. You want to say anything? You're sitting here really quietly. No, I don't. I don't I Bill covered everything. My stack uh, of training material that Bill and I have gone through is already this big, and it's only been less than two months. So uh, there's a lot. There's a lot that Bill does that people don't realize. Be a sponge. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I have soak to. up as much as knowledge as you can. Four years I have been, so this is, this is way more deep dive than what we've done before. Okay. 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 Um, Am I good to get down? Yeah, you're, you're good. You're good to go. Um, uh, it's up to the board. Um, the last item on the agenda is about investment portfolios and investment policies and funds. Um, if you want to talk about it tonight, you can. We're going to have a budget report at the next meeting. If you want to, you know, put this off, it's your choice. I'm here. Um, it's his, I thought Bill's memo was pretty good, you know, describing things. I don't know if you have questions or if you, if you want to do something now or let me, put it off. Let me hand this out anyway. I'll give this to you and take it with you. And, I didn't, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the, the balance sheet, which is the top sheets there. Um, the, uh, yes, see that? Yeah. So I, the balance sheet was for uh, March was updated yesterday. And um, so I, I, I held the whole thing for you. Um, Uh, so Bill just tells us what we should be looking for as we review this, and uh, I don't know if we need a detailed discussion. Maybe that could wait until the uh, budget review next week or next uh, meeting. That's okay with everyone. Yeah, sounds great. Okay. Um, I always managed to do this. Somehow. Didn't save one for yourself? No, I. I mean, I. I. I had. I made six copies. And then I, took, I kept one for myself. I have no senior moments. <laughs> I know the freak. It's a good thing we got Nick in here. <laughs> all right. Do you all have more than just one? Why don't we do this next time? Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. thinking like uh, wait, wait, wait. Well, I may have two. Do you have two maybe? Yeah. No, no. There, there should be. You should have four balance sheets. One, four. Yeah. I'm only seeing three Edward Jones pages and one balance sheet. Yeah. Um, we can go over it next, next time. Oh, no. Oh, no. Four, 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 four. I got there. Wait, wait one second. Wait one second. Oh, it's so funny. Sweet, so nice.
Yeah. 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 This is the norm. The norm. That's the three hours. That's what we see so far. Got me. As long as we can just be the new manager. Got me. I can't. But, you know. I can't argue so far. You won't get a mortgage. I think in the interim one, until the bill comes back, so one, it's not kind of on the agenda, but me and Danny both got an email today from a... Oh, yeah. Carrie Phillips and I, it kind of oh baffling. I was going to just baffling. email Bill later. But basically, it was titled um, Title 19, Section 1109 and 1110. And I looked those up. You know, they they were all Vermont statutes dealing with kind of roads. And she said, "Hello, Select Board Chair and Vice Chair. Is it accurate to assume that this having been posted?" Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can support it. I don't so know everybody it. needs to give me back to this stage. Uh, yeah, that's so okay. You all have different. Each one of you oh, has a different thing. <laughs> oh, we need to. We have my stuff, and I left this stuff on the chair leading out of my office, so I wouldn't forget. It, so. Okay, yeah. this is the updated one. Yeah. So this, this is the balance sheet and the investment portfolio for all for funds that we have investments in. So we won't spend too much time on this, but... Bill, I was just talking about, I don't know if you know, me and Danny both received an email from a Carrie Phillips about Title 19, Section 1109 and 1110, and which has to do with, you know, I looked it up, it has to do with, you know, roads and you know, kind of, and brief question was, the lowest select board chair and vice chair, is it accurate to assume that this is having been posted to the town's website means that it has been filled with the Waterbury select board, filed with the Waterbury select board, and is effective in the town of Waterbury? Well, I'll just forward it. I'll forward it but it's to a state you. Yeah. yeah, it's a state statute. I'm going to forward it, I'll copy you, and then okay. I'll go from there. It, it, it was kind of weird. I don't know what, you know, it has to do with, you know, roads and stuff like that. Our roads have been posted for mud. It's like abuse of highway. Right. It's bad. I don't see what she's getting at. Well, he needs to look at it, I think. Forward it to the manager and have him deal with it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so back to the investment stuff. So um, the memo that I gave you gives a description of the four funds that we have that are reserve funds. Mm -hmm. And then I sent the investment policy as well. Yeah. The, um, the uh, Veterans Monument Fund and the C.C. Fisher Fund both kind of come under the general objective or the general policies here of the uh, investment policy. And then the tax stabilization fund and the, um, the cemetery fund, the cemetery commissioners have their own investment policy that I didn't forward here. And the policy also has the Calkins fund still in it, and the town divested itself from the Calkins fund a number of years ago now, so we don't have that any longer. Um, the tax stabilization fund is the fund that uh, uh, helps provide revenue to our general fund budget. The other funds, the cemetery fund, obviously it's only used for cemeteries. And then the C.C. Fisher Fund and the Monument Fund are, are even more narrow uh, uses for that. I suggest that uh, at some point in the, maybe in 2022, we ask Gary Dillon, the fire chief, to come in and talk about the C.C. Fisher Fund a little bit. As I said, that fund was a fund that was established by the Village Fire Department years ago. It was really established by the 
fire men. It was uh, fun that they sent up, set up for themselves. <coughs> and then um, I think what they found out was that I was working with a lot of the village's money at the time and doing a pretty decent job of investing it. So they said, well, why didn't the village manage this? So the village took it on, we invested in it, and then when the, the departments merged, the town and the village departments merged, the town got the money. We don't use the money really for anything. Hasn't there been like just a couple thousand dollars has been spent in the last time that anything was spent was in 2013. Um, and and I, I just think we should understand who we're holding it for and what the uses are for that money. Um, can I go in our parking lot, a general parking lot, Carla, to invite Gary Dillon to come at some point? TC Fisher Fund? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other funds are pretty self-explanatory. Um, one thing that is, is starting to raise its head a little bit in municipalities in the state, and it's an initiative that Ted Brady, the new executive director of the LCT, has begun to talk about. And, you know, um, it seems likely after EFUD meets, uh, at their annual meeting in May, the quid pro quo for the $600,000 of um, ARPA money that we're going to give them for water projects, they're going to turn over their revolving loan fund to the town. And, uh, you know, that revolving loan fund has about $1.7 million of assets in it. Um, 1.2 of it is lent out, but there's $600,000 plus or minus uh, that's uh, in cash and investments there. Um, and a number of communities have reserve funds and some of them have revolving loan funds. But uh, there's been some talk about um, should that money be invested for uh, things to benefit Vermont more directly than they do right now. So if you look at the tax stabilization fund, for example, if you look at the balance sheet, that's fund 48. So the, the balance sheet will start with 48 on the left-hand margin. Does everybody have that? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the balance sheet, you can see there's $472,768 in investments in that fund. And you can look at the Edward Jones statement right behind it and see you know, 472768, and we can see that we have, you know, three corporate bonds. Uh, we've got a number of mutual funds, American funds mainly. Uh, we've got a Davis fund, a couple of Franklin funds, and then the Goldman fund is a, is a money market fund. Um, and then you see down at the very bottom, well, Halfway down on the second page, we have a, a protective life annuity uh, that's worth about $221,000. Um, and then if you go back to the balance sheet, if you look back on the balance sheet page, you see that um, there's $77,886 that's due to other funds. That just means it's in the checking account. So this um, Tax Stabilization Fund has $472,000 invested. There's, there's $77,886 in the checking account that belongs to the Tax Stabilization Fund. And then the advance to other funds, the $499,300, is loans that we have made to ourselves. So the Tax Stabilization Fund has loaned money to the infrastructure CIP. It's loaned money to the fire uh, fire equipment CIP. Rather than going to the bank and borrowing that $500,000 and paying interest to the bank, we're borrowing it from ourselves. And we did that a number of years ago because we couldn't get any good uh, interest rates on fixed income. You know, those bonds that we have there, you can see that financial debenture, financial corp debenture, it's paying seven and a quarter percent. Right? But it's also going to mature uh, a year from November. 
uh, the nation's bank one is going to mature in 2025. Back when we bought those, uh, those bonds, those fixed income securities, we were able to buy bonds from corporations at four, five, six percent. Some of them we, we got really good buys on things like that. Uh, but of late, you know, the last five or six years, you know, corporate bonds were paying 2% if you were lucky, you know. And it wasn't worth tying up um, uh, that much cash for 2% to tie it up for, you know, 10 or 15 years to buy a bond. So I came to the select board and I said, what if we, what if we buy bonds from ourselves? We'll pay ourselves 4% interest at the time. We, we ratcheted it down when the pandemic hit to 2.75 or 2.5, just to kind of save a little bit of money for the taxpayers. But we've been paying ourselves back, and that has been uh, helping to buoy this tax stabilization fund. But one of the ideas that's being thrown out about now is, well, uh, and I don't think anybody, including me, would recommend doing it with all of this money that we've got at Edward Jones. But maybe of the $472,000 that we're investing at Edward Jones, should we think about putting, you know, 5% of that, 10% of that, so, you know, $50,000, uh, $80,000, should we invest that with the Vermont Community Fund? Should we invest it more, you know, um, uh, in, in, in organizations in Vermont that will turn around and make investments in Vermont communities with Vermont businesses. Um, you know, when we get the, when we get the UDAG fund, uh, you know, we've made lots of investments to local businesses. We've lent the Ice Center, we've lent um, Max's Restaurant, we've lent um, the Bluestone restaurant, they paid it back, you know, they went out of business, uh, they sold the building, but, you know, they paid us back. Um, Stowe Street, uh, Stowe Street Cafe, um, uh, we have a number of the, the new Bell Block on, on Stowe Street, we put money to them, Very Hill Partners. So we're making investments with that money into the community, but we have a lot of that money also invested in corporate bonds and in stocks and mutual funds. And I'm not suggesting that we should move completely out of that universe, but should we talk about maybe investing in some other things? Is there a reason why we couldn't use some of the tax stabilization fund to loan, say, for a housing project that um, Housing for Vermont would want to do. We certainly can do that with the UDAG funds and with the CDBD funds. So these are things that I just want you to start thinking about. Some of it will require some conversations with attorneys to make sure that it's legal to do certain things. But um, you know, it, it's an idea that you know Ted Brady threw out. I've also asked them um, uh, to think about: Is there a way? And VLCP tried to do this about 25 years ago, but uh, we buy our property and casualty insurance from passive, from Vermont League of Cities and Towns, property and casualty into municipal fund. We buy our unemployment insurance from uh, VLCT Burr. Uh, we used to buy health insurance through VLCT, but we buy that directly through the marketplace now. But those two insurance trusts, um, you know, passive, they probably have 60, 80, maybe 100 million dollars of money that they have, um, you know, that they have to have for their reserves to make sure that they can pay their claims and stuff like that. And, you know, they have invested that money um, and they use a money manager. And I, I threw out to Ted Brady and said, maybe, we should use VLCT as a means to, for municipalities who have money to invest, that we could invest it through VLCT using your 
uh, money managers and, and uh, using uh, you know, the, the professional help that they get to do it. I mean, I've, I've done most of this for the town and EFUD using the local Edward Jones office. I think it's been very successful. Um, I, I think we've got a good record. But there's, you know, every, there's an expense to everything. And if you, if you pool with other municipalities, you get the same benefits of pooling that we get for, for buying that insurance. You know, that you can be investing in your, your fees are much smaller than what you pay if you're doing it directly yourself. So there's just things that I'm asking you to think about a little bit. No decisions are required tonight. Um, we will probably work on updating the investment policy. Uh, I noticed the other day there's some things in, I think it alludes to Yankee bonds. Um, page four. <laughs> What's that? There's a mention of the village on page four. Yeah, yeah. and I, I don't worry too much about that. But you know, there's there's certain things in here that um, maybe we probably we've never we've never um, purchased as a security, but maybe we shouldn't have the authority to have some of these things any any longer either. So I'll be taking a stab at that. But I'd like you to think when it comes time to amend the investment policy, if there is a way to invest in some Vermont, and I don't mean, you know, Jerry Dr. Pepper or even Ben and Jerry's, I'm talking about, you know, Vermont Community Fund, mm -hmm. um, those kind of places that are lending to small businesses and to housing. So anyway. That's all I need to say for tonight, I think. Uh, if you have questions about any of these portfolios, certainly ask me. Um, just so you know, um, I do try to stay on top of this pretty, pretty closely. And uh, it was dumb luck, but in, um, in February of 2020, for most of these funds and the village funds and even the library funds, I said, you know, the stock market has been at an all-time high. We should kind of rebalance. And we took a lot of money out, uh, sold a lot of securities, and put it just into cash. And then in March of 2020, the pandemic hit and the stock market tanked. And I could tell you that it was really great if I had pushed it all in then, <laughs> but we didn't. Uh, but uh, I have um, just a couple of months ago um, with the Edward Jones office down the street here. So if you look at the tax stabilization fund, um, it's uh, page uh, three of five. At the top under mutual funds, you'll see it says there's a Goldman FA government Fund. That's a that's a money market fund. There's eighty six thousand dollars there right now, and uh, a couple of months ago there was a hundred thousand dollars. And we're doing we're 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 buying back into uh, mutual funds right now on a basically a dollar cost averaging basis. So there's like seven thousand dollars a month that we're buying uh, securities, and at the end of the year we'll still have something, and I've got a whole memo that I didn't bring with me, but all of these funds are, are buying systematically into the market now. Uh, and, um, you know, if you want to talk about the, the uh, makeup of the portfolios at any point, you certainly can do that. Uh, it's, not, it's not my money, it's the town's money. You should review these things, look at it, if you have questions about where our money is, you can certainly raise those questions. And, and if you think, well, you know, um, we should rebalance or we should have less in, in invested in, in more in, in cash, those are things that we can talk about. We've got the information here now that you can look at. And if you have questions about it, if you're not very familiar with investing uh, and you want just a little primary, you can certainly 
come and talk to me about that. Uh, I'm not an expert, but yeah. I gained some. I'm pretty experienced in investing. The one thing I, that surprised me in a lot of those categories that in our risk tolerance proposal that we were in moderate to moderately aggressive. And I know for myself that's probably where I am, but I was surprised to see that the town would be. Well, if you read the investment policy, especially for the tax stabilization fund, uh, you know, this is a fund that, that we have in perpetuity. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, it says up to 50% of the portfolio may be invested in common equity or mutual funds, and we need to rebalance it. Um, and, you know, and then no more than 20% of the portfolio should be in any one particular fund. So uh, there have been times I've come back to the select board, like mm -hmm. five or six years ago, and said, you know what, if we keep 50% in, in, uh, mutual, in equity mutual funds, and we keep 50% in cash and in uh, fixed income, fixed income isn't paying anything, so right. the select board said, Okay, go ahead. I recommended, well, let's buy some blue chip uh, mutual funds that have uh, companies that are paying big dividends, you know, if you, so if you get a 3% dividend. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's something that, um, that we can talk about. For the tax stabilization fund, it says risk tolerance, moderate to moderately, moderately <coughs> aggressive, that, that's allowable. Uh, it, that does, doesn't mean you can't have some in something more aggressive than that. It's yeah. just, so those are things, you know, I would encourage you to look at the policy and if you're concerned about it, we can have a, a conversation. But the tax stabilization fund is something that we're, you know, we built this up to a point now that, um, you know, a few years ago the voters changed the policy with regard to taking money out of that fund. It, up until about three years ago, if the portfolio went down in any given year, we weren't allowed to take any money out. The fund's worth over a million dollars now, so the town has said that the authority is there to take up to 5% of the uh, ending balance of the fund in any given year. So even if the portfolio goes down, you can still take money and put it into the, into the uh, into the general fund, and if you're going to do that, you've got to be able to have some ability to actually make some money once in a while. You're not going to be able to take a lot out if you're only earning fixed income, or and, and it's only earning two or three percent. So I try to watch it, like, uh, I, but we I, have a, we I have a pretty good experience. It's, it's just that I'm more aggressive than like. My wife is totally conservative, but I'm more aggressive. But I always vote with municipalities that we want to take maybe a little bit more of a moderate kind of, not maybe moderately aggressive. I think that's the only way to make money is if you're, you know, a little more aggressive. Because I would say the country is only as strong as the stock market. If the, um, if we were, and that's why, you know, we don't have investments in the CIP <laughs> funds anymore. Three right. years ago, we used to have investments there. We we backed out of that completely. We don't invest anything it's the in our general stuff. reserve funds. So the ones that we are that we have investments in at all are funds that we don't use on a regular basis. They're there yeah. to to provide uh, some backup. So it's a conversation we can have. Okay. Thanks. Is there any further business to come before us? If not, motion to adjourn. So move, so move. Second. second. Motion is second. All in favor say aye. 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 I don't think I have it. Any and I would just say, it's on our website, but committee members. Yeah. And I am resigning as I said during the meeting. Mm -hmm.